Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order. The purpose of this hearing is to assess how the Biden administration is keeping sensitive U.S. technology from foreign adversaries like China while opening markets for U.S. companies in other countries. Um, I recognize myself for an opening statement. It should come as no surprise that this committee is holding, once again, a hearing on export controls. That's one of the most important things we do in our jurisdiction. They are essential to countering our adversaries, especially China, as they were to defeating the Soviet Union. During this Congress, this committee has already passed four bipartisan export control bills, and we plan to do much more. As the CCP expands their surveillance state and war machine, it's critical we stop selling our sensitive technology to them and to other adversaries. We are now witnessing a troubling trend where our adversaries use American components in their weapons and their surveillance systems. Uh, one need look no further than the CCP spy balloon that surveilled some of our most sensitive military sites. It was widely reported that it used commercially available American technology. We're beyond the point of a wake-up call. Americans' adversaries are using American innovation to undermine U.S. national security interests and our allies and our democratic values. BIS, uh, while within Commerce Department, is within this committee's jurisdiction. And we've been working very closely with uh, Mr. Estevez uh, to use its extensive authorities. Um, as was pointed out in my 90-day review of the BIS released last December, uh, these authorities are vitally important to securing our national security. While some positive action has been taken by the administration to restrict advanced chips and chip-making equipment to China, more, I believe, must be done. For instance, reports indicate that the United States did secure a deal with Japan and the Netherlands to apply similar export controls on chips, uh, which uh, I was fully supportive of and uh, helped assist with. But while this agreement is promising, it, it still largely allows uh, Japan and Netherlands to service and to sell tools to China uh, for chip manufacturing, I guess, based on future contracting. Uh, Mr. Estevez, you are in charge of BIS, and this is a very important job at this time in history. And we want to work with you and support you in your effort. Uh, Chairman Xi wants a military capable of invading Taiwan. Every day I hope you wake up and ask yourself how you will use export controls to deny China's military access to U.S. innovation and capabilities. And while we work to keep American technology out of our adversaries' hands, state needs to do more to work with our partners and allies to open new markets to American companies. We must remain competitive have a global footprint, and use soft diplomacy to counter China's Belt and Road. Mr. Fernandez, uh, I hope your testimony today will reflect uh, that as your primary goal. Uh, my bipartisan championing American Business Through Diplomacy Act aimed at opening markets for U.S. companies. And I'm concerned that some of the aspects of that law may not be implemented as fully as it could. We need that for a great power competition. I'm also concerned the White House is either not listening to our diplomats or not being told what harm their actions are having on the U.S. economy. The President's recent decision to ban LNG export permits is a perfect example of a policy that harms U.S. business interests and U.S. foreign policy. After all, it was American LNG they kept the lights on in Ukraine after Russia's full-scale invasion. I led the effort to sanction Nord Stream 2. I never imagined a president would waive those sanctions, allowing Russian energy to uh, and Europe to be dependent on Russian energy. 
but it's been American LNG that's helped Europe divest from Russia. American energy is the cleanest energy in the world. And when we take that option off the table, I think we're, we're hurting ourselves uh, and the world and putting that into the arms of China. And their energy is not clean. In fact, it's, it's dirty. Um, finally, I just on the, on the issue of Iran, I, I know Mr. Fernandez is not in your jurisdiction, but when we see an administration not enforcing sanctions on energy coming out of Iran being sold to, to China to the tune of $80 billion, that then goes into funding their terror operations, that's an energy policy that makes no sense to me at all. Um, and I know we'll talk more about that. I know that's not within your uh, purview, uh, but I just say that in this public hearing that something has to change, you know, on that. So with that, I now rec recognize the ranking member, Mr. Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. And thank you to our witnesses today for appearing before us. We're here to discuss how to effectively use economic statecraft as a tool to compete with China. Now, this is a critical topic because Beijing is intent on evading international rules and using economic coercion against nations big and small to advance its interests. To ensure that we are successful in this competition, the United States must lead, must be pr pragmatic, and must invest in the core strengths of America at home and abroad. And if we are serious about competing with China, then we must actually compete. We know the billions of dollars Beijing is pouring into the Belt and Road Initiative. We know that last year Beijing increased its diplomatic budget by 12%. But how was the United States responding? Unfortunately, the Republican House majority has proposed cuts to the budgets for the State Department and for U.S. foreign assistance. That's not leading. That's not competing. That's not being present where we need to be present. The world must view the United States as a credible partner of choice when it comes to foreign investment, development, assistance, and clean energy and infrastructure financing. To do that, the United States must scale up initiatives like the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment and Development Finance Corporation and adequately fund the State Department, USAID, and BIS. Republican budget cuts will only tie our hands, undermine our ability to compete with China, and nations will ask, where are you, United States, as China continues its presence? If we're going to effectively compete with China, we also need an affirmative trade and investment agenda. And I believe the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific economic framework is critical for keeping America engaged economically in the Indo-Pacific so that China does not replace us as the economic partner of choice in Asia. As we compete with China, we must also affirm our national security interests. The Biden administration has imposed unprecedented export controls and outbound investment restrictions against China to ensure that the American dollars and technology aren't helping China develop military capabilities. In our discussion today, I hope we can talk about how to maximize our export controls in concert with partners and allies to make these actions even more effective. And as we strengthen technological security, we must invest in research and innovation here at home so that we position American industry to be globally competitive and create the jobs of the future for American workers. The work done by this administration alongside Congress to pass the Chips and Science Act and the Inflation Reduction Act will ensure that America excels in the semiconductor and clean energy industries, both of which China is intent on dominating. 
These investments at home must also match with investments in our unique strengths abroad. Our alliances and partnerships, whether it's re-energizing NATO, launching the foundational AUKUS partnership with Australia and the United Kingdom, or hosting a historic trilateral summit between the United States, Japan, South Korea. President Biden has revitalized our alliances. In addition, the administration has advanced shared interests in the region through results-oriented initiatives like the Quad, the Mineral Security Partnership, and the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. Under President Biden, it is not America first or America alone. It is America back at the table, marshalling a united response to the PRC's coercion and aggression. Finally, and this is, criti this is critically important, we must ensure that our competition with China does not slide into conflict. And that is a loose, that's a lose-lose scenario. Too often in Congress, I see my colleagues trying to outdo each other on who is the bigger China hawk. We've seen Republicans attack General Milley, who was before our committee earlier this week, simply for engaging with his Chinese counterpart to prevent unnecessary conflict. I, for one, sleep better at night when I know the lines of communication are open and one mistake and one accident does not lead to an all-out conflict. We need both deterrence and diplomacy to keep peace. The Biden administration, through, through tough but pragmatic approach, is already paying dividends for the American people with the Chinese committing to work with us on addressing fentanyl trafficking and already acting on that commitment. This can save American lives. If we act alone, it will escalate tensions. If we don't live up to our values, then we will alienate our partners instead of isolating China. So I look forward to a spirited discussion today about how America can lead, continue to lead, continue to build the world's strongest economy, and continue to bring nations together in the defense of peace and shared prosperity. And with that, I yield back. Gentlemen, yields. Uh, we're pleased uh, to have today here the Honorable Jose Fernandez. Under Secretary for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment at the U.S. Department of State, and the Honorable uh, Alan Estevez, Under Secretary of the Bureau of Industry and Security at the U.S. Department of Commerce, before us uh, here today. Uh, your full statements will be made part of the record. Uh, I now recognize Under Secretary Fernandez for your opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman McCall. Thank you, Ranking Member Meeks and members of this committee for the opportunity to speak before you this morning. Our focus today is on countering the People's Republic of China on the world stage and empowering U.S. businesses to compete internationally. And I'm lucky. I'm lucky to lead a team of some 1,500 economic officers located in almost every country on the planet who advance the administration's economic statecraft agenda and leverage U.S. global leadership to strengthen our domestic economy. We're more effective today than ever before in promoting U.S. businesses, and we owe much of that to this committee. Chairman McCall, in 2019, you, you helped pass the, the Championing American Business Through Diplomatic Diplomacy Act, CAPTA, to recognize the important role of commercial diplomacy in promoting U.S. prosperity and competing with the PRC. And I look forward to updating you on its implementation. In addition to promoting U.S. businesses, we also have to confront the PRC's predatory practices. We're making good progress, and what I'd like to do is to give you three quick examples of that progress. Number one, we are addressing vulnerabilities in critical mineral supply chains. Almost a year and a half ago, I launched the Mineral Security Partnership to confront this challenge with key foreign counterparts, and we now have 14 partners plus the European Union collaborating to find critical mineral projects and to bring them to market. For example, the MSP has announced uh, just recently milestones on six projects in every continent, uh, ranging from extraction to processing to recycling. The MSP now has a pipeline of 23 projects, and our engagement will ensure that critical minerals are extracted, refined, and recycled in ways that benefit all of the countries involved. The second example I'd like to note is that thanks to Congress, we're using the CHIPS Act, the CHIPS Act International Technology Security and Innovation Fund to rewire global semiconductor value chains. 
Already 18 months after enactment, the ITSE program has become a new center of economic gravity. We've, we've announced ecosystem reviews for Costa Rica, Panama, Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines, and other nations are asking us whether they can be considered, and in fact, some are taking on the hard work themselves. We're leveraging ITSE funding to create a broader semiconductor ecosystem and to maximize the pull factor, and we're starting to see results. The third example I'd like to note is combating PRC economic coercion, which I know is of interest to this committee. This is one of my highest priorities, and I'm grateful for this committee's leadership on the issue. When partners face coercion, we are willing and we're able to help. I led the effort to support Lithuania almost two years ago, which faced PRC trade-based retaliation for opening a Taiwan office, and I used that case to develop a toolkit to directly support other countries facing PRC coercion. Today, Lithuania has survived the PRC's pressure, and it is not looking back. We have also coordinated with G7 countries to ensure that when the next case happens, we're ready. In closing, I'd like to just, uh, just summarize that we are leveraging every diplomatic tool that we have to bolster U.S. economic security. But we also need to deploy concrete resources to level the playing field enough to get our companies in the game. And that's why the Biden administration last week released an FY25 budget with a plan to effectively compete with the PRC. This request will allow us to continue to invest in the foundations of our strength at home, align partners on our shared interests, and tackle the challenges posed by the PRC. We can compete and we can win, but we need Congress's support to do it. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, uh, Secretary Fernandez. I now recognize Under Secretary Estevez for his opening statement. Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, members of the committee, it's my honor to testify before you once again on the importance of export controls to protect U.S. technology from adversarial countries. And yes, Chairman, I do wake up every morning and say, what can I do with export controls to protect America? Export controls are a key tool in addressing national security and foreign policy concerns related to countries of concern, including the People's Republic of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. It's clear this committee understands that importance, as this will be the eighth time that I, or the two Bureau of Industry Security Assistant Secretaries, have testified before this committee in the last two years. I think that's a record for BIS. The Bureau of Industry and Security has operated for decades at the nexus of national security, technology, and commerce. However, given today's threat environment, combined with the rapid technological change, our tools are more important than ever in protecting national security interests of the United States and our allies. We have used our export control tools extensively in the Biden administration. For the PRC, we have implemented sweeping strategic countrywide controls on key critical technologies. These include advanced computing chips needed to power artificial intelligence for military and supercomputing applications, as well as the semiconductor manufacturing equipment essential to producing those advanced chips. This countrywide approach is important because we are clearly identifying strategic sectors and items and setting clear lines on technolo technological capabilities. Additionally, key allies have implemented similar controls for many of these items. These technology-based multilateral efforts enhance our existing extensive countrywide restrictions and are most effective in addressing our national security concerns related to the PRC. We continue to add PRC parties to our entity list. In fact, adding more than 300 entities in this administration. These actions help to backstop our technology-based controls by denying PRC entities access to predominantly commercial items that could be used for military applications or human rights abuses. <coughs> BIS has also taken extensive action in concert with 38 allies and partners to impose extensive export controls in response to Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. This multilateral approach has imposed increased costs on Russia and forced them to rely on pariah states like Iran and North Korea for weapons. Russia has also been forced to expend resources to create networks to evade our controls. In response, we have implemented new controls targeting Iran and entities throughout the world who are violating our restrictions. 
We continue to act strongly with our allies and partners to detect and disrupt those networks, and we are working with industry to enhance due diligence to detect efforts to evade our controls. While this work is important, I want to be clear. The most important step we can take right now to help Ukraine is to provide funding to support their fight. New funding, along with other tools in our toolkit, will continue to impose costs on Russia and those that seek to support Putin's unjustifiable actions. And while I recognize this hearing is about China, let me be clear, China is watching our actions and our willingness to stand up against illegal aggression. Helping Ukraine is also about China. Finally, speaking of funding, BIS has been asked to do more than ever in this era of strategic competition to address our national security and foreign policy concerns. To sustain our current pace and effectiveness, there are a few realities that this committee should consider. BIS's budget for core export control functions has remained essentially flat since 2010 when adjusted for inflation. BIS's law enforcement arm employs only 150 agents to counter the threat posed by nation state actors. Our licensing workload has doubled from approximately 20,000 per year in 2012 to over 40,000 per year now, and licensing has become more complex as our rules have become more complex. Our staff is relying on antiquated systems for both license adjudication and enforcement work that were put in service in 2006 and 2008, respectively. We look forward to continue our constructive work with this committee to ensure that BIS has the resources and policy support needed to continue its mission-critical work. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Estevez. I recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Um, you know, on that on that issue, and look, I'm we're in this Congress. We're trying to cut budgets for the most part, but your mission is hugely important. Uh, and and you and I have visited many times. Many times, um, your ability to stop technology from going to China, but also outbound capital flows, is extremely important. So if you have uh, resources uh, to request, please provide that to this committee. Um, I know you have OMB, but tell them that I have asked you to report to this committee on what the resources are that you need to do your job, because I believe it's one of the most important ones. When you look at the hypersonic weapon had American component parts in it, you know, the spy balloon, we, we have to stop exporting this technology. Um, and then when it comes to outbound capital flow, um, same thing. I mean, the old school of thinking was to sanction a company and hope uh, that that would work or hope that Treasury would even sanction the company. And even if they did, they could change the name of the company overnight and the sanction has no force and effect. You and I talked about this sector-based approach, AI, quantum, hypersonics. Can you explain or to this committee why that approach is superior to the old-fashioned approach of the OFAC Treasury sanctioning a company only to see it change its name overnight? Thank you for that question, and I appreciate your support for our, our funding. As you know, I come from a place where we give you unfunded priority lists. Uh, well, I understand you. <laughs> OMB is probably, uh, yeah, I understand. <laughs> um, Sector-based approach, you know, what we've done for advanced computing chips, the chips that are going to be the key to artificial intelligence, the key to the future of warfare, in fact, as well as the future of economic prosperity. Uh, in China, where I can't tell because of civil military fusion, how those chips are going to be applied, and we know that they are going to be applied to military applications. Establishing a technological cut line and saying anything above this cut line should not be allowed in China because I can't tell its use case is way more effective. It's more effective for industry because they can understand where that line is and they can then plan out what their business opportunities are. Uh, and it's more effective from my enforcement perspective. Uh, you know, sanctions, export controls, using the entity list is a whack-a-mole game where 
uh, to your point, people change, and then we have to go after the next one, which we're happy to do, but it's way more strategic to go after it on a sector technological basis. And, I, and, and as we um, are debating our outbound capital flow bill with the Financial Services Committee, I think that, that testimony is hugely important. Um, let me go to uh, Huawei and SMIC. Uh, your BIS approved hundreds of millions worth of licenses for Intel to sell technology to Huawei. Um, can you explain that? Certainly. Uh, the Huawei and SMIC uh, rules that are in place were actually put in place in the previous administration. However, when we put in these sector-wide controls that we were just talking about, SMIC is certainly uh, subject to those controls, so they can't get the uh, equipment that they would need to make the highest end chips needed for GPUs, uh, uh, graphic processing. Can I ask you on that one? Because SMIC was able to use uh, these, the, the, the tools and the machines and American equipment to make the seven nanometer chip, which is the gateway to AI. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll assume that it was SMIC. I, we're, I can't talk about any investigations that may or may not be going, but we certainly share those concerns, and that's certainly the reporting. Uh, the, there's a process to do that. It is a low-yield process. It certainly would not be viable in any commercial company trying to sustain that process. And, of course, they did access tools before we put in our tool controls, uh, not the highest-end tools, but the level just below that. Those tools will ossify over time, and that process will be degraded. Did SMIC violate U.S. export control laws uh, by producing the seven nanometer chip? Uh, it's potentially yes. We'll have to assess uh, what the outcome of whatever. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I would I would say they, they did. Um, um, you know, finally, my time's expiring, but Mr. Fernandez, um, like I, and this may be more of a statement. I have no idea why this administration decided to stop permitting the exports of LNG to other countries. I mean, this gets back to our energy independence. Uh, Europe certainly wants our LNG. We should have had LNG terminals in Europe rather than Nord Stream 2 from Russia. That's an energy policy that really makes no sense to me. And then finally, I know this is out of your expertise, but the idea that we're not going to enforce sanctions on Iran and let them export $80 billion of energy to China to then use to fund terror operations is another foreign policy issue that, quite frankly, is troubling to me. Thank you for your question. Um, look, on the, on the LNG pause, um, this is a pause to assess the additional LNG export projects, uh, whether they are in the public interest. Uh, given the increase in U.S. LNG exports and what we know about the effects of methane emissions and, and carbon dioxide emissions, uh, the last assessment uh, by DOE took place five years ago, in 2018. In 2018, our exports were one-third of LNG were one third of what we have today. Today, our, 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 we export 12 billion cubic feet per day. Uh, we have a capacity of 14 cubic feet per day. Uh, we have right now projects coming on stream that will increase our capacity to 26 billion cubic feet per day by 2030. And those projects are not being affected by, by this pause. But when you, when you, when you stop permitting, yeah you're gonna stop production of LNG in the United States. And LNG is a very clean energy, as opposed to what China does. And so, again, this is not being energy independent. It's not helping Europe out from Russia. It's helping China at the end. It's a bad foreign policy, and I think it's a bad energy policy. And we could debate this, um, but I'm way over my time, sir. Uh, and I know that Ann Wagner has some pretty uh, so I know Mr. Perry certainly has some very tough questions for you. So I will now uh, recognize the ranking member. Who has no tough questions? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to clarify some things? Right. 
<laughs> you know, we want to clarify something. <laughs> there you go. So one of the things that I am deeply concerned about uh, in regards to the PRC's uh, routine use of economic coercion against other nations uh, so that they can advance its political objectives. And as a result, you know, I uh, sponsored and introduced a bipartisan bill called the Countering uh, Economic Coercion Act of 2023. Uh, to support our partners that are victims of the PRC and economic coercion, as well as a uh, punitive action against Beijing. So my first question goes to you, uh, I'm the Secretary Fernandez, uh, to find out what steps the administration uh, has taken to counter and deter uh, the PRC's economic coercion and support our partners when they are victims of the PRC's uh, economic coercion. <clears throat> Thank you for your question, um, and, and I, I very much appreciate uh, your support and the coordination of both houses of Congress on economic coercion, which has been one of the top priorities in, at, at the State Department for me. Uh, we, we, uh, we have seen economic coercion over and over again on the part of the PRC. Uh, Korea, Japan, Australia, the Philippines, I got involved, uh, I got involved with Lithuania, and with Lithuania, we were able to support uh, Lithuania as it looked to re react to, uh, uh, to PRC economic coercion. We were able to get the Exim Bank to double the export credits uh, available to Lithuania from 300, which is what China was providing, to 600 million dollars. Uh, we were able to get our posts around the world to, to open markets for Lithuania. We were able to get our partners around the world to, uh, to also help. We have now, uh, I'm glad to say, created a toolbox. We have a toolbox that we have developed along uh, w with, our, with other agencies, and we are now prepared to help other countries. And in fact, there's not a month that goes by that a country doesn't come to the State Department and wants to talk to us because they are afraid of economic coercion. The G7 has taken this up as well, and so I think you're seeing that we're in a much better shape today than we were, uh, than, than we were uh, a year and a half ago. And in but fact, go Let ahead. me just ask this question now. Do you think, do you need anything from Congress? Do you believe that the administration currently uh, uh, have or do they need additional uh, authorities or resources that you need to more comprehensively, comprehensively address this challenge? Is that something that we can do here in Congress? Thank you for your question. Well, the President's budget request includes uh, $1.1 million to fund the office of the Chief Economist. One of the things that the Chief Economist does when countries come to us, it, it helps to assess some of the vulnerabilities that country have, the countries have to economic coercion. We also uh, could use what, what I'm calling a banana fund, uh, which is basically agricultural products tend to be targets for the PRC, and they tend to rot as, as the PRC holds them uh, at, at port. So that would, be, uh, that would be something else that we could look at as well. Thank you so much for your support. And on the Secretary Estevive, um, I know, and you had the discussion with the Chairman in regards to the budget, and I guess the president, uh, in his budget request, included $223 million for BIS, uh, which, you know, uh, I think uh, we need to make sure we get done. Um, and you testified to some why and what to the detail of, of what uh, you think is needed. But let me just ask this quest question. In your estimation, uh, does BIS currently have the modern IT infrastructure and software to conduct this day-to-day -day business effectively? <clears throat> The answer to that is an emphatic no. Thank you for the question, <laughs> Congressman Meeks. Uh, you know, as I said, we're, we're using antiquated systems fielded in the mid-2000s using 1990s technology. Uh, you know, there's some requests before the committee for some data. We are doing manual pulls of that data right now because I do not have Google for, like, answering the questions that I need answered <laughs> and that I'd like to support the committee with. So and I have an enforcement function that also needs to be able to track who's doing what, where, that's really antiquated. And I mean, because I have limited time left, and maybe I'll try to do this in a yes or no uh, real quick, dealing with uh, China export control, because I believe the, the administration has supercharged our export control policy in the face of tremendous geo geopolitical change and challenges in the Indo-Pacific. So let me ask you real quickly, in just over three years of the Biden administration, the Department of Commerce has added, I think it's more than 1,200 entities to the ent entities list. Is that correct? That's correct. 
Oops, that's correct, about 43% of the entity list. And among those, uh, BIS has added 303 PRC entries to that entry list, is that correct? 312, about 312. 39% of all entities on China. And is it accurate that under your leadership at BIS, issued expansive new controls on items, end users, and end users as it pertains to semiconductors and advanced computing industries in China? That is correct. And based on BIS's uh, analysis, what has been the impact of these controls on the PRC? Uh, my analysis, which I would say I draw on the intelligence community and business, quite frankly, to assess that, uh, we're having a major impact in China, which will, over time, will be even greater. So my time is just about expired. It's my last question, because I'm concerned about the critical uh, mineral supply chains. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to know what steps has the Biden administration <laughs> taken to address the demand for critical minerals and enable the United States, along with our allies and partners, to secure greater controls of this supply chain so we're not beholden to China for access? Thank you for your question. Um, look, we, as you know, we have a, we're going to need exponential amounts of critical minerals to, to reach our, our clean energy goals, 42 times the amount of lithium, 25 times the amount of cobalt. That's our need. Our, our vulnerability is that right now, depending on the mineral, 100% of the graphite comes from China. Uh, 80 to 90% of all critical minerals are controlled or mined or owned by, by the PRC. What we have done is we brought together 14 countries plus the European Union to create the, the Mineral Security Partnership in order to uh, share information on critical mineral projects, invest together, finance together, and we're getting results. Just as I mentioned in my, in my opening statement, we have it in a year and a half, and this is lightning speed for, for, min, for the mining sector. We have six projects that are coming on stream. We have 23 projects that are, uh, that are coming on, uh, on board. And the one thing, and this is, this is what I take away from this, is that countries are hungry for U.S. investment. We, are, we have a different offer from the PRC. We, we, we value environmental standards. We support transparency. We, we, we cannot, uh, our com companies cannot engage in corruption. And so what we are hearing from governments and what we're hearing from countries in Africa and Latin America is that they want U.S. investment. They want our technology. They want our, 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 our uh, practices. And I hope that in the future we'll be able to co come to this committee and have even more projects that we can say we have brought on stream. We're making progress. Thank you. My time has expired. I, I yield back. Gentleman Yields, uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Wagner. I thank the Chairman. And most of all, I thank my colleagues um, for understanding and letting me leapfrog. Um, my time's no more important than any of yours, but I am most grateful. Gentlemen, vigilantly enforced and properly coordinated U.S. export controls deny China the access to sensitive technologies that it wants to steal and fuel its military modernization. However, our current export control system is deeply flawed. As a result, controlled U.S. technologies are turning up in enemy programs, such as the spy balloon that was sent over my state of Missouri and uh, the rest of the continental U.S. last year to collect data on, on frankly, our most sensitive military installations. It is imperative that our export control system is efficient, targeted, and effective. Now that China, Iran, and Russia have formed a new axis of evil to attack our national security interests and help each other circumvent U.S. export controls. And this is why I am sponsoring legislation, the Export Control Enforcement and Enhancement Act, to ensure these critical safeguards are more agile and airtight uh, Secretary, Undersecretary Estevez, I thank you um, and your staff for working with me on this legislation and providing good feedback. I look forward to continuing to discuss with your team and stakeholders as we move this bill forward. Uh, Secretary Estevez, I want to be clear that commerce must improve its efforts to keep controlled American products and IP from falling into the hands of bad actors. But we also need to pressure our allies to do the same. How are you pushing allies and, and partners to harmonize export controls and, and tighten enforcement, especially, I'd say, on microchip 
uh, technology? And what tools does the administration have to compel allies to align with our export control policies and not inadvertently uh, help China skirt U.S. export controls? Uh, thank you for that question, Congresswoman. Uh, I'm going to tweak your question a little bit because uh, we don't pressure or compel our allies. We work with our allies. That's what makes them allies. I like pressure and compelling, but <laughs> go ahead. I'm from New Jersey, but, you know, <laughs> Working with them actually leads to a good end. Uh, as the chairman noted in his opening statement, you know, we worked uh, with uh, the Dutch and the Japanese, who happen to be the other countries that have key equipment that make semiconductors. Uh, talked to them about the threat, talked to them about what we were seeing, and they instituted controls similar to ours that limit the highest end equipment, similar to what we've done, from going to China. That's not the end of that story. Uh, there's more work to be done. There's work about components that include other countries. And, you know, my uh, frequent flyer miles are rising uh, going out and talking Good. to our allies on I, that. I questions. hope so. And, and let me follow by saying, you know, in February, the administration sanctioned four companies providing material and technology to Iran's missile and drone programs. How extensive is China's support for Iran's weapons program? Um, what more can be done to restrict the transfer of Chinese origin weapons or supply of related components to Iran and its proxies like Hamas and the Houthis? So, so what we've done with regard to Iran, you know, Iran's sanctions program, which includes export controls, is actually managed by the Treasury Department. But we have, related to Russia evasion, uh, put, as you noted, controls on a number of companies. Uh, I think it's 11 more than the four that we initially put on. We put a bunch on in December as well. And we instituted foreign direct product rule, both for those companies and for a slew of other uh, EAR 99, normally not regulated controls. So that even if it's not made in the United States, but it's made with US tech, it is also subject to those controls, and we're slapping down, I think, 121 thank, thank Chinese you. companies. Thank you. Secretary Fernandez, earlier this year, the Biden administration announced a pause on pending decisions on LNG exports to non-FTA countries. This pause has injected new uncertainty into the regulatory environment in the U.S. for foreign buyers and is disadvantaging our companies um, as they compete on the global stage for contracts. At the same time, this administration refuses to enforce sanctions on the sale of Iranian energy to our adversaries. Um, while we stop our energy from flowing to the global market, we allow Iran to flood the market with their energy, keeping the world dependent on bad actors and uh, fueling China's machine. I am out of time, sir, but I would really like for you to answer in writing um, how you lead state officials on, for energy. You know, did you agree with these decisions? What responses did you want? Did you get when you engaged, et cetera? But my time has expired, and I will respectfully yield back and, um, and hopefully look forward to your answer in writing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you want to yield, the uh, chair recognizes Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to our panel. Um, I, I just I, I heard uh, earlier uh, concerns about our energy posture and the Biden administration uh, sleep at the wheel or something and uh, jeopardizing our energy security. Mr. Estevez, wearing your Commerce Department hat, who's producing the most oil and gas in the world today, number one? Not my writ, but the United States. The United States. Uh, and is it an all-time record? Again, not my writ, but I believe so. Yes. Uh, and uh, would we call that sort of energy self-sufficient uh, at this point? Have we pretty much kind of achieved that? Uh, I believe so. You believe so? Are we, in fact, now exporting oil and gas products because we produce so much for our own domestic consumption? Yes, we are. And are we, in fact, providing a lot of LNG exports to our European friends who are trying to wean themselves off Russian oil and gas? And are we not, in fact, it's, it's, is it not expanding so much that we're actually expanding uh, facilities to receive that LNG in terms of depots and tanks and, and the like, uh, in terms of constructing new facilities in Europe? I'm going to yield that to Undersecretary Fernandez. And Mr. Fernandez, if, if I could ask you, please, to speak into the mic. You're very hard to hear. 
you have a low voice. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, just very simply, uh, our, our LNG producers have really stepped up to the plate in, in response to Russia's invasion and Putin's weaponization right. of energy. Uh, right now, 70% of, uh, of our U.S. LNG exports go to Europe. We actually provide the Europeans more than 50% right. of their imported LNG. Right. So uh, across the board, actually, we're kind of hitting all records. So let's, let's stop the myth that there's a problem with the Biden administration with respect to energy. And oh, by the way, if we want to get into renewables, and I do, we're also producing more wind energy and solar energy than ever before. Is that not correct, Mr. Estevez? Uh, that I can't answer because I just yeah the recall, answer is but I believe so, yeah the answer yes. is yes uh, okay appreciate it uh, Mr. Estevez uh, recently the French president a few months ago said unbelievably that Taiwan was really an American concern and he said it I believe in China um, I mean talk about a warning light and an invitation to a hungry wolf to have at it, that fits the bill. As if Taiwan were a parochial concern of the United States. So help me understand why another country like France might be interested in Taiwan from, let's say, an economic point of view. Where are about 80, 85% of the world's memory chips produced? I'd say, uh Eighty-five percent of the advanced logic chips are certainly produced in Taiwan. Taiwan is a little more disparate. Pretty much one company too, right? That's correct. Right. Let's just repeat that. Just 80, 85 percent of the advanced logic chips right. in the world. So apparently, President Macron believes the other fifteen percent are all produced in France, Korea. Oh, so maybe France actually has an interest in Taiwan. Uh, and, and that that interest goes way beyond just the United States. Would that be a fair thing to say, just looking at it for, in terms of economic dependence and technological independence? That would be, but you know, I would also say that our goal is to have 20% of those advanced logic chips made in the United States fair enough. by 2030. Right. But, but that's across the board. That's not just aimed at Taiwan. Is that correct. not correct? We're trying, to, we're trying to uh, uh, lessen our dependence on s s pretty much single source. That is correct. Uh, China, Taiwan, Korea, whoever it may be, we, we want to make sure that- we need a diverse supply right. chain. And, and that's a supply chain issue. Uh, Mr. Fernandez, I'll give you uh, the last word on the same question, why other people might want to be interested in the future of Taiwan besides just the United States. Congressman, you're talking to a big admirer of Taiwan. I've led four economic dialogues with Taiwan where we We've talked about uh, supply chains, in fact, which, is, which are items of concern. Uh, we've talked about economic coercion, the energy transition and the like. We have, uh, actually, we can say we've got some results as well. We've got, we were able to get uh, the 21st Century Trade Initiative uh, passed, which, for which we thank you. And we are also promoting a double taxation agreement with, with Taiwan that we are now considering, and Treasury is leading that. And if we are successful, it'll make it easier for Taiwanese companies to invest here in some of the projects that Commerce is proposing. Just a little self-promotion. I helped write a bill that addresses that last issue of double tax. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. and thank you for having the hearing. And I wish I could understand why we're having a second one this afternoon, but that's a different issue. Well, we just work very hard on this really committee, good. and I really admire the Irish uh, green Kelly scarf. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, Mr. Smith is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony and your leadership. Let me ask you, um, <laughs> you know, Xi Jinping is credibly accused of genocide against the Uyghurs. Uh, I, mean, I think there's no doubt about it uh, that he is destroying uh, the Muslims in Xinjiang. He has taken over Hong Kong against what a lot of Sino watchers had said would never happen. Uh, I thought it would. I introduced the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act in 2014 when the umbrella movement was just getting off its, off its feet. Um, they're destroying human rights everywhere, religious freedom. Uh, the APEC summit, in my opinion, was a shameless uh, kowtowing to Xi Jinping, especially when so many of our businessmen paid so much uh, to meet with a guy that's committing genocide. Uh, and frankly, I believe that trade is important as long as it's conditioned on human rights respect. 
And we all know that Bill Clinton delinked human rights from trade on May 26th, 1994, after famously linking it, then he infamously delinked it. Uh, I went over to China, I met with them, uh, they said, we're getting it, long before he got rid of it. Uh, and that, to me, was the pivot point for they looking at us and saying all they care about is the bottom line. Let me just, yesterday I chaired my 100th congressional hearing. I chaired the China Commission. Uh, we focused on this horrific practice of forced organ harvesting. It's my third hearing on that. I have a bill that passed, bipartisan, sitting over in the Senate since March 28th of last year. Only two people in the whole House voted against it to really rein in on that egregious practice. Uh, everywhere you look, name the human rights abuse. Xi Jinping is excelling in it, and of course, he's threatening Taiwan. Now, I had three hearings on the whole issue of cobalt. I've been to Goma. We know that, that DR Congo is, is sending all of its cobalt to China. Um, when I asked Secretary Curry this uh, at one of our hearings, he said, oh, they have an MOU at DR Congo. It's an aspirational, not worth the paper it's printed on, really, MOU, because very, very high people in that country of DR Congo are getting huge amounts of money in their pocket in order to facilitate that. Uh, you know, if you want to drive an EV, God bless you. No problem with me on that. I have problems with its long-term environmental issues what happens to the batteries, all of that. But if the cobalt, which it is, is coming from 25 to 40,000 children through child labor in DR Congo, and up to upwards of 200,000 adults who are dying, getting sick, uh, that supply chain is so seriously tainted, uh, we gotta find some other place. Yes, American companies and others have all sold out, uh, and, you know, and that's sad. But frankly, we do have American companies here that do cobalt, uh, mine it. But it's more expensive because when you deal with China, obviously uh, everything is cheaper because of their ability to coerce labor. So my question is on the cobalt. Um, how can we, as a country, allow the importation? I have a bill I've introduced that would provide a rebuttable presumption, similar to what we did to, with the, uh, the um, uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Act, to say, fine, we'll, we'll Bring it in, as long as it's clean. It's not coming from a coercive situation uh, with forced labor. Uh, is that something you can support? I mean, we, we've got to be clear. We do not advance our goals on the backs of little kids in the DR Congo. And again, I've been there many times, uh, and, and on the back of their parents uh, who are dying in these mines. Let me, uh, let me take a piece of that and then... Sure. Um, Alan can take can take the rest. Look, just just to start from the from from the beginning, uh, promotion and respect for human rights is a central tenet of our policy. No questions asked. Okay. And in terms of cobalt in the DRC, uh, we we uh, this is a concern. And which, but I also think that from our point of view, it is also a competitive advantage if we can get involved in in the critical minerals extraction or processing and follow the highest human rights. Uh, uh, environmental and, and work with communities so that communities don't have to choose between environmental degradation and child labor and economic prosperity. That's our competitive advantage. And that's what, in, in the Congo and elsewhere, that's what countries want. We are pushing in an open door. What we need to do is to actually show up, have the resources, get our companies involved, and as well as companies from our allies and partners. Now, and I would agree with uh, what Under Secretary Fernandez just said. I know American companies are in Zambia doing uh, some cobalt mining and looking at, in that regard. I think you know having American companies using American standards uh, of labor are, is critically important to our values. I would encourage you, I'm out of time, but, but please take a look at this bill. I think it advances that goal. Again, no matter where anybody comes down on EVs, uh, it better be absolutely clean of child labor and forced labor of their, of their parents. I yield. Yes, please. Congressman, I'd, I'd be delighted to, to uh, show you some of the, uh, uh, we have put in writing uh, in the Mineral Security Partnership what our environmental and human rights uh, tenets are, principles are, and we put them in black and white. We can see it on the website. And that, again, that is a, that is a competitive advantage for, for U.S. companies. Thank you. I'm out of time. Gentlemen, yields. Uh, Mr. Sherman's recognized. Mr. Chairman, I've got a bill for you. Excellent. You mentioned capital flows. We have a capital gains allowance built into our tax code 
because we believe that encouraging people to invest in stocks means that you build the economy. We provide a capital gains allowance for those who invest in Chinese stocks, building their economy at the cost of the U.S. taxpayer. But here's the, here's the good part. China has investment incentives for their people to invest in their economy, and they don't provide those incentives when people invest here. So I'm hoping that I can get you to co-sponsor what is now bipartisan legislation to say that we don't provide tax incentives for investing in Chinese-based companies. I'd love to, the to talk to the Ways and Means Committee about this issue, but that sounds good to me. Good. Um, TikTok has come to mind. Um, it's a national security issue. It's also uh, an economic issue uh, and one of fairness. Uh, Chinese companies make a lot of money showing Americans cat videos. Um, does China allow U.S. apps on the phones of Chinese citizens so that they can see cat videos in a way that makes money for American companies? Uh, Mr. Estevez. I don't, believe they, that they, I don't believe that they do. So why in the hell do we let them make money on our cat videos when we can't make money on our cat videos? Um, uh, Under Secretary Fernandez, um, we've got the uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. It involves a host of countries that seem to all kind of be in Taiwan's neighborhood, plus us, of course. Um, what is the current posture of including Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework? It, we have an open architecture. Uh, Taiwan uh, and any other country can apply to join. So there, uh, do we expect uh, that the other countries in that framework would be happy to have uh, Taiwan join? Uh, is there a reason they're not in it? I, I, I wouldn't be able to speculate, sir. Uh, I will tell you that uh, uh, Taiwan is one of our largest trading partners. It's yeah. a large, and, and, uh, Mr. Estevez, an is there economic. any political uh, obstacle to Taiwan joining the, uh, the effort? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, so I'd want to point out that the Biden administration has done an unprecedented job in uh, export controls to China. I understand there are 2,888 entities, uh, uh, entries on the entity list, and that 43% of those are added by the Biden administration. Uh, do I have that correct? That is correct. Um, it's, we have the uh, BIS, which is designed to effectuate our export controls. It's my understanding that that has been flatlined in uh, appropriations. Does BIS need more money? And uh, given the fact that if I went to the grocery store with the same amount of money as I took in 2010, I'd be considerably thinner than I am now. Uh, you know, isn't the, haven't we seen an actual cut in our efforts uh, to implement export controls? Our, our budget, to your point, has been flat. Our workload and then has when doubled you say, and uh, it's uh, way so more complex. Flat. Flat, not even adjusted for inflation, flat, flat, adjusted flat. flat. For adjusted for inflation. Adjusted for inflation, yep. but that's it. But we have more technology, more trade, and uh, how many more applications do you have to deal with now than you did 15 it's years ago? It's gone from 20,000 to 40,000, and again, way more complex. Gotcha. Uh, one more thing. Uh, there is uh, I, well over 100 companies who's chi in China whose activities are an anathema to us. Some of them human rights violators, some of them just integrated into the, uh, the military industrial complex. And they're such an anathema to us <clears throat> that no American can buy any product of that company. If they happen to make uh, uh, paper clips, you can't buy the paper clips. Uh, so if, you can't, if the company's so bad that you're not allowed to buy anything they make, can either of you gentlemen figure out why we would allow Americans to buy stock in such a company? Or, do, or, or is this just uh, a congressional oversight? Well, I, I will tell you that what we have, uh, what's now in the works, and what's what, uh, and you know this is a uh, is a very narrowly focused uh, 
outbound investment uh, rule on in, in for products that could end up in in China's military uh, uh, fusion well, complex. I got another bill for the chairman that says if you can't buy a product of a company, you can't buy stock of a company in, in, in China. Uh, it's not as interesting as the first bill I brought up, but I'm bringing it up at the end, and I yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Wilson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here today. And indeed, uh, we look forward in a bipartisan manner to work uh, with uh, Congressman Sherman on his very innovative uh, initiatives that he's proposing. Uh, but as we begin, I want to thank Chairman Mike McCall for his leadership this week. On Tuesday, uh, he actually created a historic uh, significance uh, in that, sadly, the appeasement in Afghanistan was revealed with 13 Marines murdered at Abbey Gate was solely the responsibility of Biden. On August 26, 2021, Biden blamed the military for the, for the disaster. But with the leadership of Chairman McCall, we now know with General Mark Milley and General Frank McKenzie, they verified Tuesday that the irresponsible decision was Biden alone. Equally, we found out that uh, as Biden blames Donald Trump, uh, there have been the violations of the Doha Agreement by the Taliban, and Donald Trump has indicated that it was conditions-based and he would have never left Bagram Base. And so that was a, a historic uh, hearing that we had, and then today we're grateful to be here with you. And that is, Secretary Fernandez, Indo-Pacific countries are in the middle of energy crisis. Current production levels cannot meet the growing demand for energy in the developing countries, and many countries in the region do not have geopolitical topography for the support of green energy sources such as wind, hydro, and solar. Many countries have expressed a desire to work with the United States on transitory energy such as cleaning current coal resources or natural gas to meet energy demands while improving the current environmental standards. Yet, utterly irresponsible to me is that the Biden administration has announced restrictions on gas, oil, and LNG exports, putting these countries in a bind and having no choice but to uh, proceed to alternative suppliers such as the Chinese Communist Party. Current record exports by the United States are the result of the Trump administration's successful policies, not the current administration. And in fact, there's a contrast. As Trump promoted energy independence, Biden is promoting battery dependence on Chinese batteries. And there seems to be a Biden obsession for creating dependency on Chinese batteries, destroying American jobs. With the current proposal to cut back on exports, uh, Secretary, how does this affect uh, particularly LNG uh, exports to Japan? Congressman, thank you for your question. Um, and let, let me say it again. It's an LNG pause. It's a pause designed to figure out by, for, by the OE whether additional uh, L, LNG export projects are in the public interest. That is, a, that is an assessment that the DOE will make. The, the circumstances have changed since the last uh, since the last DOE assessment in 2018. We now export three times, triple the amount of, the, of LNG that we exported in 2018. We are due to double that by 2030. This pause does not affect current projects uh, and assessments. So, and I have spoken to colleagues in Japan and they understand what we are doing. Uh, they, we have doubled exports. Uh, in, we intend to double exports by 2030 with existing licenses. On, on Afghanistan, if you, I, uh, I, I'm not gonna get into, I, into some of the specifics. I, I will tell you this. I keep a photograph in my office of, uh, of, an, of a, an Afghan uh, worker standing on line at the airport and I can see the panic in his face. Uh, we, are, uh, my, my colleagues at the State Department, including me, uh, work night and day, and, and we, 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 we stand by that work. On, on batteries, uh, I, w I will, let me just say that um, the Inflation Reduction Act has already led to substantial investments in, in, in battery manufacturing in the U.S. I was in Georgia 
uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, Georgia, and, and, hey, Georgia and, and, has received. Hey, my, my time is about up. But indeed, the Inflation Reduction Act, how irresponsible is that? Almost a trillion dollars uh, to be used to subsidize uh, Chinese batteries. Uh, I, I find it totally irresponsible. It has nothing to do with uh, inflation reduction. It has everything to do with promoting dependency on Chinese batteries, as you're just revealing. And, and that, that's just uh, irresponsible. And we should be promoting uh, uh, our efforts of LNG and gas exports uh, to produce American energy independence. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Aceves, you mentioned in your opening statement that China is watching our actions in Ukraine. I agree. Can you expand on the importance uh, of us right here in this Congress as we take two weeks off uh, and we're on vacation and Ukrainian uh, soldiers are going to be dying in the front line? Can you expand on the importance of how that commitment is to our allies and our coalition uh, for our security in Indo-Pacific, as well as our economic uh, interest in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we just had a bipartisan Senate bill, not just, frankly, five weeks ago, uh, passed by an overwhelming margin. And we sit here to take two weeks off and don't act on this. So you mentioned it in your opening remarks, and I'm glad you did. Uh, can you tell us how important it is this, that we honor our commitment to our coalition over 50 other countries, including in the Indo-Pacific, uh, working together on this and not shirk our responsibility, which frankly, uh, with 185 members signing a discharge position, all Democrats, but I must say, uh, including members of this committee, uh, I think over 100 Republican members at least willing to vote for this if the Speaker of this House put it on the floor for a vote. Can you tell us as we talk about this issue this morning, how important that is to the things we're talking about here. Certainly, I'd be happy to, uh, Congressman. I really appreciate the question. I know, you know, my rated Department of Commerce is export controls, and we have tight export controls on Russia. Unfortunately, you know, export controls don't cut and immediately uh, stop the Russian defense industrial base. It's more like the squeezing of an anaconda. It's a slow squeeze. While we were doing that, we need to supply Ukraine with the weapons they need. That is, as a national security professional, 36 years in the Department of Defense and my current uh, two and a half years at Commerce, supporting our allies, showing our allies that we have the spine and backbone to meet our commitments, our commitments to NATO, our commitments across the Asia Pacific, uh, in front of malign actors who would overturn the world order that we established about 80 years ago already, post-World War II. Uh, Russia's challenging it, China's challenging it. That's why they're smoozing together. Showing that we will stand up to aggression is critically important in providing Ukraine the funding that they need to, to without US boots on the ground, to sustain their fight against Russia and Putin's illegal invasion is critically important to our world standing. Well, thank you. I think it's, uh, it's just not about democracy, uh, although that's fundamental. It's also about, people should realize, it's about their pocketbook uh, and, and what things are going to pay. Along those lines, you know, I just left a, another hearing where uh, we had heard testimony about Russia's desire uh, to secure a, a port in Sudan. And we look at China's uh, uh, activities in, in Djibouti and how they can, but it's not just in those areas. China is trying to gain port access and control all over the world. Uh, can you talk about the effect of China's ability to, or, and their desire to even do more, uh, control the navigational ports all over the world and, and how that affects us economically, uh, not just in the Indo-Pacific, but around the entire world. If I could take that. Uh, uh, China has uh, made um, investing in ports a, an, and strategic infrastructure a priority um, through, the, through BRI, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, through a number of investments. They also have a national security law, obviously, that, that compels uh, Chinese companies and Chinese nationals to follow national security dictates. This is a concern. And what we are doing is uh, we started a strategic ports initiative, uh, state and the NSC and others, to work on, on, on funding 
companies that want to invest in, in ports around the world and also to work on other infrastructure involving maritime uh, trans transport. Yeah, it's fair to say, these are, you're talking about trillion dollar issue here. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Uh, uh, the, the BRI numbers are astronomical and they, they dwarf whatever we have at DFC and, and in, other, in other initiatives. And American consumers right now, in my opinion, are being price, price gouged uh, because of the cost of shipping. Uh, you add to that what's going on with the Houthis uh, in the Red Sea and, and their disruption and the cost of that. Uh, this is something we should clearly be focused on as our own policy. So I thank you for your testimony and I yield back. Gentleman yields, the chair recognizes Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Estevez, the Institute of Forensic Sciences, I'm sure you're familiar, uh, located in East Turkestan, used to aid and assist in the um, genocide and the experimentation on the Uyghurs. Um, I'm curious about your delisting that entity in November of last year. Can you walk me through that the rationale? Thank you, uh, Congressman Perry. Uh, first, the listing was for human rights violations, as you note. Uh, we, of course, uh, and I shouldn't say of course, we take human rights uh, concerns seriously. There are 70 or so parties on the entity list uh, related to human rights violations. Uh, this institute, which is a Chinese uh, uh, state organization uh, engaged in uh, crime control, uh, it was certainly uh, uh, engaged in uh, bad things uh, with regard to the Uyghurs, and in fact, receives no exports from, no exports of note, like a couple but, of things. Uh, look, that's all like superfluous background information. Uh, I'm but, asking but about- But it's pertinent the to, the, to the fact that you're asking about. So the delisting of that went through process, the normal process requires a 4-0 vote across the interagency. It got a 4-0 vote. Uh, and as a result of that, the Chinese have engaged in cooperation for uh, stopping fentanyl precursors from flowing to uh, Mexico and other yeah, places. That, that, that's working out real good. well. So uh, what I'm interested in, OK, so it got a 4-0 vote. I don't care about that. That's group think or whatever. Tell me, Americans dead a day from fentanyl. And yeah, I know, fentanyl. and and they keep dying more and more. That point is, is that's not working. The Chinese gave us lip service, and we delisted this organization that is hiding the the fact that they're using the Uyghur for genetic experimentation and then manip manipulation and potentially warfare against them and us. But that aside, tell me about what factors went into the decision. The factors that went into the decision related to Chinese cooperation related to fentanyl precursor, stopping fentanyl okay, so, precursors. So, so it re relates to the fentanyl precursor manufacture, delivery to Mexico, and so on and so forth. How is that being measured? What's the metric of success that says, if we, d we do list, you're going to do this, and this is measurable how? Is it in the deaths of Americans that's increasing every year by fentanyl or not? It's in stopping the deaths of Americans, Congressman. So is that working? Are you saying that we're stopping the deaths of fentanyl? Is that your testimony? I'm saying that we're stopping the flow of precursors related to this action. You were stopping, so that's your testimony. The precursors are being stopped. The precursors of fentanyl are being stopped that, because of this. That's the goal, Congressman. I'm sorry? That's the goal, Congressman. I, I, I get it's the goal. Yeah. That's a great goal. But when it doesn't happen, because China says, yeah, we'll do it. If it and doesn't then, happen, then we can turn that around. So how long, how many deaths are we going to wait? How many does that cost? As you know, Congressman, it doesn't, just like any other thing with control. Well, I, look, I'm just looking for the metrics, sir. I'm not trying to be difficult. I, I, but I'm going to turn it over to Undersecretary Fernandez to tell you how. Well, I got other questions for Secretary Fernandez, but I, I think I. Well, I'm sorry? We, we run the process for delisting. The actions that are taken are being done in other agencies other than my own. Yeah, so, so that everybody can do this and people can keep dying. Mr. Fernandez, regarding the DOE's decision on LNG exports of January of this year, did you object to the decision? No. So 
you act as though we've had other reviews and this is similar to that one, but on the other reviews that have occurred, has there been any pause as a relation to the review? I, as, I, had, I, had, I, I can't tell you what has been Let me tell you, there have been none. So right now we're talking about the pause that's happening is for contracts that are being bid for 2030. For 2030, let me ask you this. The other countries that we might be competing with or that, that, that are strategic adversaries to the United States, to say the least, do you think that they're concerned with environmental justice issues when they make considerations about their LNG production and exports? I like Iran. Do you think that's a topic for Iran? By, by 2030, Right now, without with the existing guidance, we will have double. It doesn't okay, matter, oh, sir. Let, let me finish. Let me finish, please. Uh, and clean energy and, the, and 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 climate are are critical issues to this administration. Now, you, you we can argue about climate change. We can get into that. But as far as we are concerned, so so my we, question it, for it is you, the existential okay, challenge of our time. I, it's great if it's double, triple, quadruple. That that's irrelevant to me. The question is is what other countries that we're competing with are considering environmental justice? Countries like Iran. It, it is not about environmental justice. Well, it says so. If, if that, may, that's if, one if, of the considerations, if, wasn't if I, it? If I may. Sir? If I may. I'm it, listening. It is not about environmental justice. It's it, about so that was not one of the considerations? It, it is not about, and, and again, we are doubling. I'm just asking, sir, was that one of the considerations? Which one? Environmental? Environmental justice. The, the, in the pause. One of the considerations was to allow DOE, the Department of Energy, to conduct an assessment based on change. And was the, one of the things that they were assessing environmental justice? You will have to ask DOE. You're the, sir, it you, says energy in your title. You Don't ask, you know this? You will have to ask. DOE is conducting the assessment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes uh, Ms. Titus. <clears throat> Excuse Titus. me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, coincidentally, I, I want to take a minute to kind of brag about a bill that we passed this morning, Mr. Barr and I did, that had to do with the cooperation with China. I think you and the President are right to say that we want to keep the bilateral... Uh, uh, I'm over here. Oh, okay. Okay. I, didn't, I couldn't tell if y'all were talking to me or talking to somebody over there. Uh, about the science and technology agreements. And so I'm, I'm glad to see those move forward because I think we can benefit from them as well as the rest of the world. Uh, but I, my question has to do with another meeting that I had recently. Just yesterday, I met with the president of the Federated States of Micronesia. And he was expressing some of the things that we've already talked about today, the attempts by China to, for financial inducements, their uh, impacting economic relations, diplomatic relations. You were talking about ports. Uh, as you look at what China is doing in this part of the world, can you just tell us, uh, Mr. Fernandez, Mr. Secretary, what it is that keeps you up at night when you think about uh, those relations and how we can attempt to counter them? Thank you for your question. Um, the U.S. and our allies have helped to maintain the peace and security uh, in the Pacific Islands uh, since World War II. And we've also uh, made uh, possible the economic prosperity and development that you see there. Um, we are we have we are putting in a lot of time and effort and attention uh, on the Pacific Islands in response to uh, uh, a pattern by the part of the PRC of making uh, vague confidential deals that relate to fishing practices, to security and the like. Uh, the president has had two leader level um, summits with Pacific Island leaders in DC. We are actually showing up and uh, Secretary Blinken has been there, a number of my colleagues at state, a number of other uh, departments as well. We've opened two new embassies. We have uh, since, in the last two years, we we have $2 billion in commitments to the Pacific Islands. Uh, we, we increased our contribution to the Tuna Treaty, which is an important treaty uh, in the Pacific Islands. And we're co cooperating on IUU fishing. Um, we are we are doing a lot. And I personally was involved uh, with uh, in helping Google 
to whether it's a, a cable that's supposed to go from Chile to Australia, uh, with uh, a with a number of, of spurs going to the Pacific Islands. So I think you will see and you will continue to see renewed interest on the part of the administration in in, in working with Pacific Island countries. Yes, sir. Would, would you like to add to that? That that's really in uh, under Secretary Fernandez's writ versus mine. Are you making progress with the settlement from the uh, radiation left from the testing of weapons in the Pacific Islands? That one is outside my, my remit. I'm, I'd be happy to take that That back. seemed to be kind of a sticking point in some of the agreements. Yeah. But now that we've passed the COFA, it seems like some progress is, is being made. And the, the president was optimistic and uh, hoping to see the, some of the benefits for social programs restored there. And I think that's something that we might want to look at, too, as we uh, strengthen our relations. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. I yield back. Yields. Uh, Mr. Barr is recognized. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, um, Under Secretary uh, Estevez, uh, question about BIS licenses. You and I have talked about this before. I appreciate uh, the work that you're doing. Last year, I asked you how many BIS licenses were approved for companies that wanted to do business with entities on the Department of Defense 1260H lists, that's the Chinese military companies, or the Treasury list, the, the uh, NSCMIC list, the Chinese military industrial complex uh, list. Your response was that you needed to get back to me. That never happened. Uh, let's try again this year. Do you know how many BIS licenses were approved for companies that wanted to do business with entities on the DOD 1260H list or the CMIC list? Uh, I don't know that answer. Uh, I know. Don't, don't you, can, can I just say, that's okay you don't know. Well, maybe it's okay, but don't you think that's a really important question for BIS? Here's what I would say. I, I, you know, you and I uh, have had this dialogue and we'll continue to have it because yeah. I think we're making progress on the overall list harmonization issue, yeah. which is the real point that I, I think you want to get at. So that when an exporter looks, whether they're at SDN on OFAC or whether they're on the entity list or they're on the DOD list, which actually has a completely different use case, so it's really not in the same vein. Uh, but the exporter knows that they need a license to, to come and get it. And then, of course, licensing policy on the entity list, you know, mostly is presumption of denial, but there are some variances to that. An exporter actually looks at a consolidated list. They see all that when they do that, so they know. For us, you know, we just put out a rule this week, yesterday, in fact, related to OFAC and entity list synchronization related to Russia. Uh, there's other things that we can do in that. So th th there is progress in that. Well, why, why, why would commerce ever issue a license for an American business to export or do business with a Chinese military company or a Chinese military industrial complex company? What possible interest do we have in that, in granting that license? If, if, you know, again, if they're on the entity list, it depends on when the policy is set and how. And, and I'm not saying we may not, but I, right. I want to know it, it, what like, would be it, the interest of the United States in issuing that license. For, for the most part, there is none. Okay. For the most part, it is a presumption <laughs> of denial. You know, there are licenses, frankly, to give desks and chairs and okay. stuff like that. All right. Which would be weird that the Chinese would be buying desks and chairs from us, but so be it. Okay. I'll take that trade. Okay. Yeah. But, but for stuff that's meaningful to a military organization, no. Okay, well, <clears throat> we, we, we just want you to stay on top of that. I don't really, and I don't think members of Congress on either side of the aisle are really interested in issuing licenses to, to, to do business with Chinese military companies. Neither okay? is the Undersecretary of okay. Commerce, by the way. <clears throat> All right. Um, emerging and foundational technologies, uh, Secretary Estevez, under the Export Control Reform Act, BIS is required to keep a list of emerging and foundational technologies 
implement controls on those technologies and work to establish multilateral controls with other countries and report the results to CFIUS and Congress, including the House Foreign Affairs Committee. When was the last time BIS submitted this required report to Congress? I believe our last report went out last year. And uh, Under Secretary Fernandez, as the person responsible for state's participation on CFIUS, have you received this report from BIS? I, I personally do not know the answer to that question. I can go back and check. Uh, we have other colleagues at, in, in, my, in my bureaus who are more directly responsible for CFIUS. Well, <clears throat> we're, it's, it's 2024. We passed this bill in 20, 2018. We got to get on it. Uh, and ECRA implementation has been painfully slow, and we want commerce and we want state to be on top of it. So let's, let's uh, uh, keep that going. If, 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 if I could, Congressman, for, under FIRMA, which again, you know, I got to testify before your committee and for FIRMA, and I'm glad that it passed, CFIUS does not need to see any list to understand where to put controls and, and what investments to make. CFIUS is working the way it should, but we, we do share technology uh, requirements with CFIUS, which I happen to have a say in. My time is, has expired, but um, <clears throat> I, I want to just make the point that whether we do sector-based investment controls, Mr. Chairman, or whether we do sanctions or both, what we want, and I know the Chairman shares this view, what we want is precision and certainty and clarity for the American private sector. So implementation of the executive order or legislation we're working on, we don't want the private sector to be guessing. We want, we want the American private sector to know what is red light and what is green light. That's what the export control system has achieved largely over the years, and we want that to be the case with outbound uh, capital flows as well. Concur with you, Congressman. I yield. Uh, and uh, gentlemen, yields. I, I would like to take it, uh, uh, this opportunity to ask you, Mr. Estevez. We've uh, financial services has a bill, foreign affairs has a bill. Ours is sector based. Theirs is OFAC uh, sanction based. Is there, um, in your opinion, I know you're a sector based person, sort of like I am, but is there a way to combine both approaches? And, and would that be more effective? There probably is, Congressman. You know, you're coming up off the top of my head here. Right. Right. But, I mean, we do it with things, you know, sector-based that I've done on semiconductors and semiconductor equipment, or what we would say, artificial intelligence don't support Chinese companies that are building models of X, you know, 10 to X, 26, uh, or something like that. And we could say, don't support these companies as well in your investment. Uh, so, you know, the stock exchange thing that Congressman Sherman was saying, mm. don't buy their stock, don't support those companies. So I think there's a, probably a combination that you could do that gets at the full gamut of what needs to be done. Well, give that some thought. And um, perhaps if you get back to me, Mr. Barr. Happy to. That'd be very helpful. You bet. Thank you. Um, Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Uh, Stanton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member for holding this important hearing. Thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Mr. Chairman, owe you a big thank you. Arizona owes yes, you a big thank you. you. Chairman, you are a champion of the CHIPS and Science Act. The President of the United States and Secretary Armando, Department of Commerce, were in Arizona yesterday, as was I, to announce the largest investment of CHIPS and Science Act resources to Intel. Uh, which has its largest manufacturing facility in my district uh, in the state of uh, Arizona. Th those will also benefit their manufacturing facilities being built in Ohio, in Oregon, as well as uh, New Mexico. Equally as important, supporting the security of the supply chain that goes along with it. Incredibly apropos for today's uh, con conversation. $8.5 billion dollars in investment to grow semiconductor and improve security in the semiconductor supply chain. The Chips and Science Act investments are intended to spur American manufacturing and shore up national security. But these invest investments need to be complemented by appropriate export 
controls administered by the Bureau of Industry and Security that make sure that these important innovations work for the American companies and bring resources and jobs to American families and ensure that our supply chains are as secure as possible. Export controls are most effective when imposed by multiple countries, not done just unilaterally by the United States. Under Secretary Estevez, how has the Biden administration worked to, to rebuild international engagement on export controls after a few years of taking unilateral action? Uh, thank you for that question, Congressman. Uh, in the semiconductor space directly, uh, you know, we, we moved out on some controls, some sweeping sector-wide controls with regard to China. But we were talking to our allies as we were doing that. Our allies, fortunately, share the same threats, share the same values that we see. And shortly after we took our action, they took similar actions so that they have also stopped uh, the highest end of semiconductor manufacturing equipment from going to China, but that can threaten us in the future. We know that there are still gaps in multilateral export controls. U.S.-China Economic and Security Commission's 2023 annual report showed that China was able to stockpile semiconductor manufacturing equipment between when the U.S. implemented its October 22 semiconductor export controls and when Japan and Netherlands fully implemented theirs in September 2023. What is BIS doing to ensure our allies are honoring and implementing their respective semiconductor export control rules in parity with the United States? And that's for either witness. I'll take that. Uh, first of all, we monitor sales across the globe, just the way as if we were buying stock, quite frankly, <laughs> looking at the investments to make. Uh, I am racking up frequent fire miles, talking to our allies about what they're doing how they're doing it and making sure that we have parity between U.S. companies and the companies in, the, you know, uh, in our allied nations so that we're all uh, having similar controls going. We're also looking for regard to China, servicing of that equipment that was sent before the controls went into effect so that we can ossify those tools that they already have. And of course, we're also working at components. We've stopped components going. We're working with our allies to bring them in to, to, for them to do likewise. In your experience, how do PRC actors work around U.S. controls, and how can we better crack down on those measures? For the, for the most part, for, the, for semiconductor tools, you know, they're huge, a couple containers worth of equipment to move. So it's fairly hard. That's, uh, you know, critical to us. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there's always uh, a way we have an enforcement activity and plus working with DOJ where we are prosecuting when we see violations of our controls. Do you have the tools you need or could Congress pro provide you more tools in this important effort? Con Congress could absolutely provide me more resources. I have 150 export control agents. I have antiquated systems that they operate on. We could do better. And we're doing pretty good with, without those resources. I appreciate the uh, testimony. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Under Secretary Estevez and Under Secretary Fernandez, do you both agree that China is actively supporting Russia's war in Ukraine and Iran's support for Hamas? Uh, that's actually a more nuanced question than it would seem, but there's certainly Chinese companies are certainly providing uh, capability to Russia, and we are putting Chinese companies that we see doing that where there's American technology involved on the entity list. Look, the um, the unlimited partnership between China and, and Russia is 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 a reality. Uh, uh, Russian oil exports to, uh, to China have increased dramatically, as well as PRC exports back to Russia. Uh, that is a concern, and we continue to monitor it. So at what point would you impose countrywide restrictions on China, not just entity listings, either to impair China's ability to support these countries or to, or to uh, impose consequences? I guess uh, you have to ask. I'd have to know what you want to put countrywide controls on. 
semiconductors, for example, much of the semiconductor uh, production is not flow from the United States. So our, our ability to control is somewhat limited. Uh, we have used foreign direct product rule, and we continue to do that. And so then it's what's the distribution network flow? And we're working with American companies, quite frankly, so that they cut off that flow as well. Okay. Um, Undersecretary Estevez, ensuring full and robust enforcement of U.S. export controls is vital and necessary to prevent Iran from tapping into U.S. goods and technology for missile and drone production. Given the ongoing proliferation of Iranian missiles and drones often made with U.S. origin uh, components, uh, can you please, and, and in, China, excuse me, in China, can you please explain how this administration is working to restrict Iran's access to U.S. origin technology? And I'd say it's really not U.S. origin, it's U.S. company branded, not necessarily made in the United States. I just need to put that nuance. We have uh, about 20 companies related to Iranian uh, drone and missile production on the entity list with foreign direct product rule. We've also put foreign direct product rule on commodity level chips, the AR-99 chips, which are not the highest end chips that we control at a higher level, but we put foreign direct product rule on those going to Iran. So again, we can stop that flow, and when we catch people violating that flow, depends on you know, where they are. We can either prosecute entity list. There's a number of tools that we're using. Do you, do you have an update that you can share with us on the outcomes of the task force set up to look into the presence of U.S. and European uh, components, including American-made microelectronics and Iranian-made drones, including those used by Russia? I mean, we're all, we are always taking apart stuff in Ukraine and then assessing where it came from. You know, there's also counterfeits and other flow that goes into that, even though it might look like a, a U.S. part. Uh, we're working with companies, again, to stop them from selling to distributors that we identify that could be bad distributors. In other words, their distribution network, which is generally good, is now providing stuff to Russia or selling to companies that are providing to Russia. And again, we're using the entity list as a tool in that regard. I, I would just add that in the last two months, uh, Alan, uh, uh, my, our under uh, secretary at Treasury, our counterpart, and, and me have been calling companies specifically in order to uh, tell them that there are unintended uh, leakages of their products ending up in the U Ukrainian battlefields. And we're getting, we're getting their cooperation to, to try and staunch that flow. And we're giving them the data so that they can take action. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields. We now recognize uh, Mr. Costa for five minutes questioning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I uh, think that the uh, importance of the hearing regarding countering China on the world stage and not only dealing with American businesses, but our, the Chinese military as it reflects, re reflects to the threat to our part of the world in the Pacific is critical, and I commend the um, committee for its hearing. Uh, I want to take a little different twist on this because my view is, is that for any administration and for the Congress, China is an adversary, China is a, um, a competitor, and China is a vast market, and that makes it difficult. And we're talking about the threat that is posed here as it relates to the nation that it's an adversary to us and to our allies. Um, the, I, I want to do it in context of legislation that we've been looking at here that would counter that. Uh, I believe the administration supports the effort on the supplemental piece of legislation that would have provided $2.58 billion to bolster U.S. and allied capabilities in the Indo-Pacific. Is that correct? Sir. And we have a supplemental, we have an alternative to the supplemental uh, that we are trying to get heard on the House floor that would provide $4.9 billion to provide deterrence and operations in the Pacific. I don't know if you've seen it, but if you're supporting the Senate bipartisan package, I would assume you'd support this as well if we could get it uh, for a vote on the floor. Is that correct? 
Congressman, we, uh, we, we've requested um, $4 billion in discretionary funding for right. in the Pacific. Well, my time's limited, but yeah. basically you want additional support, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and the reason for that is we've got to show up. Countries are looking for all I agree, and we've got to show up not only here, but as it relates to Ukraine. And I want to put these two in, in, in a comparative analysis. It's been two years since Putin launched his brutal invasion of Ukraine. Last week, Putin delivered an annual state uh, uh, propaganda or the union to the Russian Duma and said that, that uh, as far as he went to threat nuclear war if NATO sent troops to Ukraine. But let's be frank about it. Russia today is a syndicate, I think, that's masquerading as a nuclear, <clears throat> as a, uh, uh, a, a nuclear syndicate masquerading as a country with a mob boss called Putin. Uh, that's how I describe modern-day Russia. Uh, and if you don't view that, uh, look what he did just three weeks ago with his adversary, uh, Alexei Navalny. He did what mob bosses do. He eliminated his, his opposition. But I think that China is watching what we're doing in Ukraine, uh, just as Russia is trying to determine what is the resolve of the United States. And that's why I think the two are in the same category, frankly, and whether or not Congress provides this supplemental aid in any form, both to protect our interests in the Indochina as well as to protect our interests in Europe with our allies there. Uh, I met with a group of Ukrainian officials three weeks ago when I was in Kiev, and you see a group of brave Ukrainian uh, folks that are they're not only fighting for their sovereignty and their democracy, uh, but for ours uh, throughout the world, which is what Taiwan's trying to do is maintain their sovereignty and their democracy, as well as our allies in Japan and South Korea and Australia. And so I think there's a good comparative analysis about what we do with legislation to provide support, not only as it relates to the Pacific, but also as it relates to our European allies. But we're stuck with gridlock here in the House of Representatives. We can't get the supplemental bill to the House floor. We can't even get an alternative to the House floor that would provide funding for Ukraine, Taiwan, and Israel. Ukraine is fighting uh, and putting up a fight that I think is in our interest, just as our support for Taiwan and our allies in Japan and South Korea. When you look at what's happened uh, in Ukraine, they've regained over half the territory that Russia's took. They've reopened the Black Sea. Uh, and they've stricken over two-thirds of Russia's tanks and 315,000 of Russia's troops. But I think, <clears throat> for many of my Republican colleagues, uh, I think they're showing weakness to Putin. I think this is analogous to 1939, when, when uh, Neville Chamberlain uh, you know, went and appeased Adolf Hitler, because people recognize strength. Uh, and so I think the Speaker and my Republican friends need to talk about putting together a package that will provide supplemental aid to Ukraine, to Taiwan, and to Israel. Uh, either of these efforts, I think, would really reflect a bipartisan support that has been there traditionally. A significant amount of the funding, by the way, stays in the United States as we build new weapons and replace weapons in our own stockpiles. So I think this, whether it's how we fund it in the supplemental package or whether we fund it in another way, the longer we delay aid to Taiwan and to Ukraine, the more Xi and Putin will exploit the situation. That's the bottom line. Our adversaries respect strength, and Putin won't stop until Eastern Europe is in his grasp as Xi is watching to see whether or not the U.S. will support its allies. Do you agree? 100 percent concur. Let me close, Mr. Uh, Chairman, if you uh, very, uh, very quickly, yes, to, to quote uh, an American president who understood strength. President Ronald Reagan said it best in 1984 when he said, to keep peace, we need to, we, to keep peace, we and our allies must be strong enough to convince any potential aggressor that war will, could bring no benefit and only disaster. I think by abandoning support and funding for Taiwan, for Ukraine and for Israel sends an opposite message to our adversaries and the rest of the world. The world is watching, and I ask my Republican colleagues, are we going to stand up with right. democracy or are we going to stand up with Putin and Xi? The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Burchett, for his uh, five minutes questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Estevez, on October 27, 2023, the Bureau of Industry and Security issued a 90-day pause on firearms exports. 
That pause should have ended January 5th, 2024. Why is it still in place? It's still in place, Congressman, because we are trying to craft the policy that meets the goals of stopping diversion of guns to uh, criminal enterprises while still allowing uh, proper sale of guns in, uh, in, across the globe. Where are we at in that process? We're close. I can't give you a timeline, sir. And I have a hard time being close when we're dealing with something that I think is constitutionally uh, sound. Um, during a campaign speech in 2019, Joe Biden referred to lawful firearms manufacturers as the enemy. Do you think lawful firearms manufacturers are the enemy? As someone who used to buy firearms for the military? No. What if they want to buy them for civilians? Constitutional right. But what's your opinion of that? It doesn't matter what my opinion is. My I think opinion we know. Is that, uh, Did you or anyone at the right. Department of Commerce have conversations with the White House Office on, of Gun Violence Prevention prior to this decision? This decision is going through the normal interagency process. Did you have that conversation? This, this, this process is going through the normal interagency process. So you're not going to answer that. You're not going to answer that. I'm also talking to industry and Congress. So the answer is yes? We've talked to lots of people involved in this process. I'll take that as a yes. How many licenses have been affected by this, sir? The pause has affected uh, licenses that were pending, and it's really a very small number, uh, maybe 1,000 applications, about $10 million a year of, uh, of uh, impact uh, for the pause. We have uh, $6.2 billion of being processed. Would 4,000, the number 4,000 surprise you? 4,000? 4, 4,000 licenses that have been affected by this? So 1,000. 1,000. Is the Bureau of Industry and Security reviewing existing licenses for possible revocation or suspension? The only, what we would do that if we see uh, certain violations of uh, the, the end user. That could happen, but that's not part of this process. That could happen through regular course. Right. We see a uh, diversion of a weapon from an end user that was legally sold to, we would stop those sales. Mr. Chairman, this is an absolute weaponization of the federal government by the Biden administration, who from the moment Mr. Biden began campaigning was dead set on attacking lawful firearms manufacturers. This is an attack on the livelihoods of honest and hardworking Americans. This isn't about the Second Amendment. This is about how people make a living. Government should never have the power, should never have the power to stop lawful Americans from providing for themselves and their families. But this administration has taken it upon itself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield the remainder of my time. The gentleman yields, and uh, Mr. Estevez, if you would, make sure the mic kind of pull it in a little closer. We're having a hard time getting you on the recording. So, you got it. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Amo for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you to our witnesses, uh, Undersecretary Fernandez and Undersecretary Estevez. Um, this morning, I voted in support of the Science and Technology Agreement Enhanced Congressional Notification Act. Uh, which would require reports to Congress on science and technology agreements between the United States and the People's Republic of China. I was proud to vote for this bill because bilateral science and technology agreements are essential for the United States to facilitate international cooperation with the PRC. Importantly, this bill also recognizes that research and trade must be beneficial to Americans and prevent the People's Republic of China from using our research uh, and technology to harm our national security. The House has recently taken action on concerns that companies owned by entities in the People's Republic of China are collecting sensitive data on United States citizens. President Biden has also expressed concern about this data being transmitted to the Chinese Communist Party and issued an executive order late last month to prevent that data brokers and other commercial entities from selling Americans personal information to countries of concern. At a high level, I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Fernandez, you know, what keeps you up at night? 
on, on the STA? Or yeah. uh, no, just more broadly uh, with uh, China and their engagement uh, on data, but beyond. Thank, thank you. Uh, what keeps me up at night? Um, <laughs> uh, well, it's a little bit outside of the, of the remit of, of this hearing today, but what uh, I've been to Kiev, and we've had a lot of discussions here about Ukraine, and uh, I, one of the things that struck me as I watched is older people uh, would walk past uh, a bomb, bombed out building looking straight ahead, determined not to let uh, Russian bombs affect their daily lives. Uh, I've been in Warsaw in a children's and women's uh, center where millions of Ukrainian women and children are refugees. I was a refugee myself. I know what that feels like. I've seen mothers sitting on the corner in that center uh, quietly sobbing so that their children would not hear them. Uh, these are children who refuse to paint uh, with colors. They paint in black and white, and what they paint is uh, plain strafing Ukrainian cities. Um, they prefer that. They cannot bear to, to paint in colors. I think when, when, I, when I can't go to sleep, I think of these older citizens, I think of these um, women and, and, and children in, in Warsaw, and then I think of their husbands and sons on Ukrainian battlefields that right now, as we speak, uh, these people have to choose uh, when they're in facing a Russian onslaught, whether they have enough, whether to fire or not, because they may not have enough bullets. Um, and I, and I, I'll, I'll be frank with you, I, 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 I look at myself, I think, how could I look these people in the eye? Uh, and the reason I say this is that Ukrainians do not have a plan B. They know what comes next if Putin wins. Russia has tried, denied the country's existence before. You've got to go back to the 30s. Ukrainians lost almost 10 percent of their population to the Great Famine. When mothers dying from famine, dying, dying from hunger, would leave notes for their children saying, if I die, it's okay to eat me. That is, that is a historical fact. They, they, they lost thousands more during the Great Terror, and they know exactly what happened in Bucha uh, a couple of years ago. And so I, you ask me what keeps me up at night? Well, um, the world is watching. Uh, it's watching us in Ukraine. It's watching us in Poland. It's watching us throughout Europe. It's watching us in Russia. And it's watching us in China. And you know what? It's also watching us in Taiwan. And so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for this hearing about Canada and China. And I look forward to uh, questions on, on that, on my specific remit. But I will tell you this, and if I have, if I leave you with anything uh, today is, is this, if you want to counter China, fund Ukraine, beat Putin. That is the best that we can do to counter China. Well, Mr. Fernandez, I appreciate you taking a, a broad interpretation of my query because that all should keep us all up at night. It's why we're all compelled to action, which is why I hope, and not just hope, but I hope that, 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 that we turn uh, that, that concern, uh, that fear, uh, into real action on the floor of the House of Representatives as soon as possible. Thank you, and I yield back the remainder of Gentlemen my Gentlemen, I now recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. And the United States of America is still the greatest and most powerful nation in history, and we can win any competition with communist China. The only question is whether we're going to do it the smart way or with our hand tied behind our backs. At every turn, the Biden administration has hamstrung American businesses and ceded ground to the Chinese communists. Most recently, the Department of Commerce, which has the statutory duty to foster and promote foreign domestic commerce, completely stopped the issuance of renewal and renewal of certain export licenses to, to American exporters of firearms, ammunition, and related materials. This pause was dumped on American businesses with zero warning and zero stakeholder engagement. This action by the Bureau, Mr. Estevez, is costing this industry over $100 million and is creating a mass uncertainty you said the pause would last approximately 90 days. We're on 100, day 146, a 50% increase in what you predicted. I appreciated Mr. Burchett bringing that up. In November, when this pause was first announced, I led 87 of my colleagues and sent you a letter demanding an explanation on this unprecedented action. 
All we received in response was an unsubstantial letter that grossly misrepresented reports from the Government Accounting Office, the GAO, and the ATF. First of all, the GAO report was addressed to the Department of State, the Department of Commerce, and its only recommendation was for state to increase firearms trafficking investigations. For the Department of Commerce to claim this as justification for freezing an entire industry is absolutely absurd. Secondly, the GAO report re repeatedly emphasized that existing data is not sufficient to warrant permanent changes to export policies. That's a quote. And that trafficked firearms are overwhelmingly sourced through the black market. Even the ATF report openly admitted that less than 1% of the firearms lawfully exported from the U.S. were associated with an international gun crime. Stopping the lawful exportation of firearms does absolutely nothing to prevent international gun crimes. But it will destroy an American industry, and people will lose their jobs. Rather than facilitate commerce and help our businesses compete against China, BIS is targeting American gun exporters for crimes they did not commit while the real perpetrators of violence go unpunished. The industry is already highly regulated. Any action to limit U.S. participation will only allow countries like China to step into the void. China is among the largest exporters of these types of firearms, and it's well known that the CCP's strategy to combat the United States is to destabilize Western Hemisphere by trafficking its fentanyl precursors, so there's no reason to think that they won't do the same with firearms. To right this wrong, of course, I introduced the Protect American Gun Exporters Act. The bill would force the Department of Commerce to stop this insane policy. It's imperative that we end this so-called pause and allow American exporters to compete. If the Bureau of Industry and Security doesn't change course, international gun crimes will only increase and China will step into the vacuum. And I can assure you the CCP doesn't care who, who it's selling to or worse, other nefarious people. Mr. Estevez, what is the delay? Why are we still, you said 90 days, you got that wrong, why are we still not uh, done with this? Thank you for that, Congressman. Uh, the pause is on a limited, small sector. Most gun sales are still taking place. Gun sales to Europe, to Asia, allies, all taking place, which is where the bulk of the gun sales do take place. All military to military, or you know, sure. government to government. We're talking hunting, hunting place. stuff. That's exactly right. Right. So it's a, a small segment of gun sales that are on pause. Right. Why is it? Why is it not done yet? It's not done yet because we are trying to craft a rule that gets after the issue of the version to criminal elements, which I know we all want to stop. Sure. Right? So it's a shared value and still allow valid sales in the world. So we're trying to craft it so that we get after that small but segment you, you that can be diverted. Supply, you understand supply chains, right? I mean, if one guy wants something, let's say I want, uh, I don't know, widget X, and this supplier isn't getting it to me, I'm not going to sit and wait forever for you to approve widget X to be sold from your country, I'm going to go look somewhere else. And then when that supply chain is established, our guys have lost the business. And oh, by the way, it's not just the gun manufacturers. Think of the shippers. And they're mostly in Democrat districts, like Philadelphia, right? They're, they're, those are jobs lost. Uh, and, and we may very well, I mean, I don't know, is it, is it your intention to put this industry out of business? Congressman, most of the gun sales that are... Uh are not impacted by this pause, so they're still taking place, including shipments around the we, we've world. We've got manufacturers in my district with contracts over $100 million, and they can't ship a thing. So you tell me no that it's just No existing licenses not were stopped. So if they had an existing license, that's still valid. These are, are contracts that are signed, um, and they're saying they can't ship. I, I can't, you know, the existing maybe, licenses maybe. went. So it's, the pause only impacted a small amount. And of course, I'm talking to NSF, NSF repeatedly right, right. to get this right, Congressman. Okay, well, we need to get this done. We need to get this done. Right. Thank you, and I yield. Uh, I now recognize Mr. McCormick, the gentleman from Georgia, for five minutes questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Chinese theft of intellectual property in the United States military te technology is a major problem. In 2022 report, the Washington Post mapped more than 300 sales over three years from U.S. companies producing technology that went directly to Chinese companies involved in CCP, hypersonic, and missile programs. In the report, the Washington Post claimed it spoke to six Chinese scientists and, quote, working in military labs and universities who described almost unfettered access to American technology with applications in design and testing of missiles. These are some of the most effective missiles that can be used against American military personnel and equipment. Um, does either one of you know how many Chinese nationals are students in our top universities here in America right now? I, I don't. I don't either, but there's lots of Chinese students in America. Sure are. <clears throat> Chinese national students, over 300,000 easily. We average probably over 350,000 Chinese nationals in our top universities, learning our best technologies to take it right back to China, along with all the other secrets to make the best technologically advanced weaponry against the United States, including chip making too, by the way. Uh, do we know how many H-1B visas have been issued for Chinese nationals that are currently working in the DOD or protected technology such as AI here in America? Congressman, uh, well, the answer is I, I don't have an exact number. I can answer your question. Approximately? I, I, have, I do not know, sir. I can, okay. I can take that back. But it, okay. Um, it, so I, neither I, one of you knows. Okay, very good. If you like. I don't know either. But I bet you it's a huge number because it's capped at 7% per country. And I guarantee you where they're putting the applications are is to take those exact things that the Chinese national scientists basically said, we have unfettered access to these technologies. I find it somewhat, I, I, I didn't ask the question, sir. One okay, second. Okay. Thank you. Um, when we talk about Bureau of Industry and Security and the secrets to get literally way laced to our military, and I'm, I'm a military man for 20 years, it worries me that they have missiles and other technologies that could hurt us and lose us a war in the future. Uh, we actually have uh, uh, HR 6542, which I hope will be passed soon, that will actually limit Chinese nationals along with Iranian nationals and North Korean nationals and Russian nationals from having H-1Bs that gives us access to the DOD and other protect. I would suggest that your, your bureaus also work in conjunction with us to limit that access for national security and for our own good. Uh, that's just an encouragement. Um, to add to that, Chinese, na the China, the CCP has announced they're gonna take over Taiwan by 2027. Approximately how many AI percentage, uh, in percentage of AI chip production, how much of our AI production is produced over in Taiwan right now? About 85% of the advanced chip production in the world is in Taiwan. For AI, it's about 100%. Uh, they produce about 90% of the world's AI chips, the other 10% in Samsung. Well, well certainly so, all NVIDIA. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, what my, my point is, if China has unfettered access to our technologies, and now they said they're gonna take the one place that we make all of our AI chips overseas, that is extremely concerning. The CHIPS Act did not correct that, by the way. I, think, I just want to make sure that the public knows this, that we're not doing anything to protect the most valuable technology and the most transforming technology we've ever had in human history. It worries me. And because in China, quite frankly, there's no civilian government divide and any company helping produce next new technologies is tied to the CCP and their military. The U.S. should not be directly or indirectly funding Chinese military companies and must clamp down on the blatant espionage and cybercrime that steal U.S. technologies and military innovations. I know I'm almost out of time, but I want to know how you guys are working to protect America, its best interest, whether it be in economy or military or industry, all the things we need to do to protect America and then the next generation in the most important technologies that will advance our ability to fight wars and to advance our economy. Congressman, let me jump real quick. I know 36 years DOD sustaining and building weapons for U.S. forces mm -hmm. so that we always have technological overmatch whenever we send a uh, sailor, soldier, airman, and marine, space guardian to the battlefield. L let me also we, we have put sweeping controls on the most advanced chips, the chips that you mentioned made in Taiwan, for artificial intelligence, the future of warfare, 
and the tools to make those chips to China. We are going to stop the Chinese from being able to use our technology against us. Let me just add something, um, if I may. Um, look, uh, our best in the world universities thrive in part due to the fact that they're open to the brightest minds in the world. Uh, we continue to, to admit and, and welcome the vast majority of Chinese students who want to come here to pursue degrees and make tangible contributions in their academic fields, and they can also benefit the U.S. We review every visa in sensitive disciplines so that we could impact national security. We actually engage in, in, a, in, in a targeted screening process. So we are, we are aware of this, but we also have to be careful. And I speak as someone who used to be involved in the, in the, in the university. We've got to be careful about denigrating and, 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 and targeting specific nationalities of students. I think we also have to be careful to protect the national interest of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I think it's naive to think that the, the United States is going to be safe from the CCP, who's actively engaging 350,000 students here in the United States at our technologically advanced universities if we think we're going to vet them enough to keep our secrets Gentlemen. from them being used against us. With that, I yield. Thank the you. gentleman's time has expired, uh, and he yields. I now uh, yield to uh, Mr. Heisinger for five minutes of questioning. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, Under Secretary Fernandez, uh, last week I sent you a letter regarding the increasingly concerning issue of China's economic coercion tactics. Uh, particularly in Europe, uh, to influence the economic and political decisions of U.S. allied nations. These tactics range from targeted trade restrictions to leveraging investments in critical infrastructure as a means of exerting political pressure. Uh, we have all heard of the examples from Lithuania and, and Norway, uh, where a particular industry caught the full force of these PRC tactics in the form of embargoes. Uh, all of this was due to a political decision made by their government uh, and their governments and entirely out of their own control. So um, first, how is the Department of State addressing the impact of China's economic coercion on Europe and what measures are being considered to support our European allies in countering these tactics? Thank you for your question, Congressman. Earlier I spoke of what we've done specifically in Lithuania uh, which was the first test case that we had. Uh, we worked interagency. We were able to double their, the export credits that the, that the PRC had provided. We got them additional markets it was through, our, through our posts. Uh, the Department of Defense uh, signed the procurement agreement. Right now, uh, Lithuania is thriving, and they are, they are grateful for, this, for, what, uh, for what we were able to do. Uh, we have, since then, we have been engaging our... our our interagency, uh, we now have a toolbox. We've also engaged a number of our allies and partners. We are coordinating with them as but, well. Yeah, let, let, let me and explore so, that a little bit. And my I mean, point is, we now, we now receive on a monthly basis, we now receive uh, inquiries from countries that are afraid of being targeted by the PRC, and we're helping them. So what, what are you doing to develop that unified strategy against this coercion and, and, and making sure that our, our responses and our allies' responses are aligned and effective? Thank you for your question. Um, we have done a lot. We've actually we engaged a number of our allies and partners. The G7 has actually taken as one of its main projects economic coercion and responding, creating a platform for economic coercion. We have we have progressed on this. This we're not perfect. We could do more. Okay. We'll, we'll get better, but we are we're quite good at it by and, now. And what, what what role has the U.S. played in strengthening international norms and legal frameworks to deter economic coercion and protect the sovereignty of nations in making their own political decisions and economic decisions? In other words, you know, how are are we able to do anything on that international stage with norms and and structures that? mitigates or lessens the impact of China or strengthens our allies and our and other nations? Well, well look, the, the Lithuania example convinced the Europeans to pass an anti-coercion instrument, an ACI. We, we, uh, we welcome that. They also filed a case against the PRC. Uh, I think rather than legal norms, I think we just got to beat them. And that's really what we're trying to do. 
Okay. Appreciate that. Uh, Under Secretary Estevez, um, do you believe that Chinese facial recognition is dangerous to U.S. foreign policy interests? I believe, uh, you know, facial recognition technology is widely used. Yeah. But Chinese uh, technology capturing faces of U.S., uh, I'd be concerned about, yes. Are, are you tracking reporting that China has been export, exporting facial recognition technology similar to systems used against the Uyghurs to countries like Burma, Myanmar, yeah. uh, which are being run by mil it, it, military? Hickvision's on the entity list. I can't stop outbound exports from China. Uh, but are you aware of those reports, and are you tracking it? I am not, but it doesn't surprise me. Okay. Well, it's our understanding that uh, companies involved include Huawei, uh, uh, Hike Vision, and, uh, and with Hike Vision, at least on the entity list, uh, will uh, BIS take action to fully include Huawei on that entity list? Huawei is on the entity list. Okay. And uh, so if they're on the entity list, I thought I just heard you say that if they aren't on the on the entity list, you have no ability to track that or no ability no, to... No, I have no it, ability to stop exports out of China. I stop exports into China. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Secretary, thank you. Appreciate that. Secretary Fernandez, well, I'm seeing my time is up, uh, but I'm going to... Uh, uh, I'm going to follow up on a letter. We did have a second letter to you, uh, and I would appreciate uh, your timely response on that. So. Thank you, and we will respond to your letter. Okay, thank, thank you. you. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Or Madam Chair. You. We changed I chairs while I, I was busy oh. with my questioning. So, Madam <laughs> Chair. I would like to now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson. I uh, thank the gentlelady, and I thank uh, our witnesses. Appreciate the work that you do. It's an incredibly important mission uh, for our country that it go well. So. Uh, for your leadership and for the people that work uh, in your, uh, under your uh, supervision, I, I wish you great success. Uh, I am concerned, uh, prior to Congress, I came from a manufacturing background. And American companies can compete with other companies very successfully, but with China in particular, we're not competing with companies, we're competing with a foreign government. Uh, is it either of your assessment that China is in compliance with their obligations under the World uh, Trade Organization Treaty? I would defer to my colleagues at, at USTR on that. Uh, we have certain, we have, I can tell you, we have lots of concerns about uh, the fact that they are, do not, um, they compete unfairly, they have, they have subsidies, uh, they have state-owned enterprises, but I would specifically in the WTO, I would let my, my colleagues at the USTR answer that. Likewise, that's a, w, that's a USTR question, but I'd like to understand. Well, very Fernandez, very deferential of you, but let me tell you, they're not. subsidies. No one, in the, no one in the country believes China is a market economy, and the base promise that they made in exchange for these pet special privileges would be that they would function as a market economy, and they don't. They don't just do that to the United States, though. They do that to countries around the world. They block market access. They shape it. They steal intellectual property, frankly, with a whole-of-government approach. Um, none of these are market behaviors. The subsidies are very targeted. And because of that, I think it's especially important that we pay attention to our supply chain risks. So I think this falls into your purview very directly for both of you. Um, is China more... Or is the United States more or less dependent upon supply chains from China over the time you've been in office? And why so? I'll, I'll start there. I think the answer is we've made great progress on supply chains. And I, 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 I will cite the Inflation Reduction Act. We've gotten, and we've gotten just in Georgia last week, or when I was there a month ago, actually, $12 billion in terms of Korean investments in, in battery uh, battery manufacturing in the in the critical mineral space. We've created the mineral security partnership uh, in order to deal with the vulnerability that you correctly point out exists. We are we are in in, in very vulnerable to to Chinese control of, of of critical mineral supply chains. But we've created a a partnership of 14 countries plus the European Union includes India includes 55 percent of the world's GDP, and we're making progress. It, it, we didn't get into this problem. Uh, in, uh, just uh, now? We I certainly mean, didn't get into this problem just now. 
Uh, but I don't know that we're making incredible progress. You cite, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, which uh, does spend a lot of money, but I won't say that it's it's solving the the problem. I am glad that uh, one of the big investments is in Ohio uh, with Intel. We welcome them and hope they continue to build their plant there, which was paused for a bit. We hope the administration will work to get the permitting uh, accomplished that they need. Um, but when we look at the, the core dependence upon China, one of the areas that you cite has stalled battery production in plants all over the place because they can't get access to cobalt. And that's because China controls it. And we're not making progress on some of these critical minerals. We're addressing it, we're talking about it, we're giving speeches about it, we're spending money to do it, but it is not getting solved. Uh, so what on the horizon do we, do we see that is actually going to change the status quo? And when I hear some, I think that we have Department of Education witnesses here defending Chinese students, and the reality is we're supposed to depend, defend our market from Chinese influence and control, and frankly, national security vulnerabilities. So what on the horizon is actually addressing it? So, sir, um, the Inflation Reduction Act and uh, has, has spurred a, a a lot of investment in, in, in U.S. battery manufacturing. Uh, just it, it created jobs. This is right now, and just in a year and a half, we have the, over. The whole thing is a Green New Deal, all right? No. So, so it, it isn't. But, You're killing American energy. We're not exporting American energy. That it's making us more dependent upon China, not less. And we've got the administration foolishly banning electrical steel. They're trying to stop American companies. The only intellectual property is American, and the Chinese are stealing our, electric, our uniform grain electrical steel that we sh should be building our electric grid on, and you guys are facilitating it under the Green New Deal, co-branded as the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm sorry, the, the, the numbers just don't, do, not, do not support that. I yield. Thank you. Let me now recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Kathy Manning. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ranking Member Meeks, for organizing this hearing, and thank you to our witnesses for your service. Under Secretary Fernandez, I am very concerned about our adversaries' attempts to dominate the next generation of critical technology. And one area that I don't think gets enough attention is Russian and Chinese attempts to influence and dominate international technical standards through the ITU, the IEC, the ISO, and the IETF. Does the State Department have a comprehensive strategy to counter the malign, their malign influence in these critical standard setting bodies? Thank you for your question. That actually is something we have spent a fair amount of time on. Um, when three years ago it, it dawned on, certainly on me, that the Chinese were dominating a number of the international organizations. Um, we put together a, a group to work on them, with, and, and that's at the State Department. We are, one of my colleagues is leading that. We also started working with our allies and partners. And in fact, this was one of the points discussed in the Trade and Technology Council with the EU. Since we started working on it, we've had some, I think, major successes. We've been able to support the, the, uh, the, the, the winner in the ITU, Telecommunications Union election, an American. Uh, we've also been able to uh, uh, support the, 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 win, the winning candidates in a number of the other organizations, including ICAO the, uh, in, in Montreal. So this is something that we are spending a lot of time on because, you're right, um, standards will dominate, will set the, uh, the, the table for, the, for things like 6, uh, 6G, uh, submarine cables, and a number of the telecommunications and ITU technologies that are coming down the pike. Thank you. Under Secretary Estevez, as head of BIS, you oversee the Office of Anti-Boycott Compliance. This critical office ensures that American citizens and businesses are not forced to comply with unsanctioned foreign boycotts, including against our ally Israel. And since October 7th, the, the October 7th terrorist attacks, have you seen more demands by foreign actors for American businesses to boycott Israel? Uh, nothing that's come to my attention on that, though we have strengthened our anti-boycott uh, uh, rule set so that, you know, 
we're giving people uh, credit for self-disclosure, we're asking for self-disclosure, but we've also put, if you don't self-disclose and, and we stumble across you, the administrative penalties are gonna be higher. I hope you will keep an eye out for those kinds of boycotts because with everything that's going on uh, in the Middle East and with all of the attacks on our ally Israel, those boycotts are sure to erupt. Uh, and I'll ask both of you, how do state and commerce regularly engage with private sector and industry leaders? Are most American companies supportive of and aligned with our ge geopolitical strategy towards China? And what can we do if they're not? You know, I'm obviously through my export control regimes, stopping billions and billions of dollars of sales. Uh, I spent a lot, a lot of time talking to American companies about why we're doing that. Uh, they may not be happy at the end game, but they're supportive at the end game because they see the not, you know, my, my controls are for national security uh, and they see the importance of national security. Uh, Secretary Raimondo said, democracy is good for business. I would agree with that. And in fact, Alan and I have cooperated in a number of instances where we're reaching out to companies for support uh, in, uh, in keeping their technology away from Russia and, and, and China. Thank you. And um, Undersecretary Fernandez, I heard you respond to a question asked by one of my colleagues when you said that China is watching everything we do, Russia is watching, Ukraine is watching. So would you agree that one of the most important things we should be doing in light of uh, those countries watching what we are doing, would you agree that one of the most important things we should be doing is passing the Senate bill for supplemental funding to Ukraine and Israel, the bill that the speaker refuses to bring to the House floor? Well, as I, um, as I said earlier, um, if you want to counter China, uh, uh, fund Ukraine, beat Putin. There ain't no way, no other way to do it. Critically important to our standing in the world. Thank you. With that, my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize myself. Uh, I want to thank both Undersecretaries Fernandez and Estevez for appearing before our committee today. Undersecretary Fernandez, in, uh, just before uh, today's hearing, I sent you a letter expressing concern with the challenges that our American businesses are facing in the People's Republic of China. Uh, you probably heard the same thing. American businesses have been subject to coercion behavior such as raids, confiscation of companies' property like telephones and computers. That behavior is largely seen as retaliation against the United States for sanctioning Chinese Communist Party officials for their human rights abuses and also as a retaliation for the U.S. taking action to secure its most sensitive technologies through export controls. So what actions can you tell me that State Department is taking to address the CCP's retali retaliatory actions against American companies operating in China? Thank you for your question. I received your, your letter yesterday and, and you'll get a written response. Um, look, um, and, I, and I, I, I get U.S. companies all the time who come into my office. They are afraid to make their, uh, their complaints known to the PRC, so they ask us to, to take, do, it, do it on their behalf. But this is the, in the nature of this regime. It's not an aberration. Um, the, these reports are a serious concern to the investor community, and what, what, what the PRC is trying to do is basically thread a, a line between uh, conducting raids on foreign companies and also uh, asking them to invest as, as, as foreign investors. And companies... Talk specifically about what you are doing to help protect American interests. So we... Doing business we there. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what we're doing. We, I, I engage with them, uh, with U.S. companies, all the time. I, we, have, um, uh, we have issued business advisories. I have been the skunk in the room when, in, in, at, 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 at U.S.-China... Uh, what does business advisory I, entail? Telling that? them not to do business because of these? What does that business advisory that you talked about It basically says entail? you've got to be careful uh, in the PRC. You've got security laws that are vague, that are 
that are arbitrary, that, that can be used uh, against your employees, can be used against you. Uh, as Secretary Raimondo has said in the past, uh, China is taking actions that are, are, are making it uninvestable. And so we make that point. Um, earlier, you spoke about a toolbox that State Department offers for countries facing economic coercion. Yes. Can you share what tools are available for vulnerable countries in the Indo-Pacific, as well as what measures are the Department of State implementing to better protect our partners in the Indo-Pacific from economic coercion? Well, um, as, as I said earlier, uh, we have a number of tools in our toolbox. Uh, some of them, uh, frankly, we, we didn't know we had. Some we were learning as we go along. Uh, Exim Bank has been quite helpful. Uh, the DFC, DOD, a number of the other agencies are embassies. In the Indo-Pacific opened up uh, markets for Lithuania. Uh, we're working with a number of other countries in the, in the, in the Indo-Pacific as they express our concerns about Chinese Can you also coercion. talk I'd about... Be happy, if, I, if I could, I'd be happy uh, in a different setting to give you some more details on that. Okay. Well, can you tell me what the uh, Department of State's plan is to encourage American businesses to move their critical supply chains out of China and towards like-minded and free trade-oriented partners throughout the Indo-Pacific? Look, let's be clear. We're, we're talking about the de, uh, de-risking, not decoupling. Uh, we are not telling people to, to leave China. What we're just saying is there are, we are p providing opportunities for countries that want to go elsewhere to open, up, uh, uh, to open up factories there. We're doing it in Vietnam. Uh, we're doing it in the Philippines. I just came back from both places. We're doing it in Latin America, uh, and it's, it is succeeding. We're getting companies that have decided to move, uh, move their offices, move their factories, and, and we are supporting that through uh, the ITSE Fund, in, uh, which is part of the CHIPS Act, uh, yeah. as well as through the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Well, thank you. Um, one last question. Countries in the Indo-Pacific import significant volumes of goods from PRC, and the PRC is the largest trading partner of most countries in the region. So how big of a factor are unfair trade practices in making countries in the Indo-Pacific vulnerable to economic coercion? They're very vulnerable. Many of them are vulnerable, uh, and which is why they come to us, and they ask us what, how we can help them. And you know what? We are we are uh, we're, we're providing help. Thank you. I see that my time's up. Let me now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Self. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you've mentioned uh, several words that I wanted to pick up on: de-risking, and then your comment if you want to counter China. Uh, so I want to pick up on a low-tech uh, area, which is the critical mineral supply, and uh, I very much appreciated your written testimony under Secretary Fernandez. Uh, I talked about uh, we have an advantage they cannot match our allies and our partners. You started the uh, Mineral Security Partnership. Under that, you mentioned 14 partners, Estonia, uh, Czech Republic, Australia, a graphite in Mozambique, uh, the UK, Tanzania, and you now have a forum. And you end your written testimony with that engagement will help ensure critical minerals are extracted, refined, and recycled in ways that benefit all the countries involved. I want to talk about our national interests. 49 of the 50 rare earth minerals are located in Alaska. Uh, I have in front of me a list of the 55 executive orders and actions tar targeting Alaska since January 20, 2021. Um, there was one executive order with six uh, critical elements to it on the day that President Biden took office. Uh, he also revoked the DOI's previous National Oil Preserve Alaska order. And in 22, he reverted the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska back to the 2013 plan. Uh, he, the day he took office, he put a moratorium on congressionally mandated ANWR leasing. And there is some question about whether that was a taking of leases that had been sold. We also have, they pulled a, in, in, by the way, 
That was January 20th. The Alaska delegation met with him on May 24th, on December 9th of 2021, December 2022, and March uh, 2023. My recommendation to the Alaska delegation, stop meeting with the White House, because after every one of their meetings, they get more executive actions to include a preemptive veto of the Pebble Mine area. Uh, placing new surface mining re regulatory requirements on Alaska. Um, these 55 actions could help solve exactly what you mentioned in your testimony for rare earth minerals and other critical minerals. Why in God's name are we targeting our own domestic uh, rare earth and critical mineral mining capacity in in favor of something called the Mineral Security Partnership, which is international. Um, a couple of, of, of points, uh, Congressman, and thank you for your question. Number one, uh, it is not, it, it, the, the MSP is not necessarily for international projects. It also, we have looked at projects in the U.S. Uh, and, and secondly, um, it, some of the points that you just raised are outside my, my re remit. I don't, I don't deal with, with those issues, but I will tell you that we very much uh, want to find projects in the U.S. No one country can solve this uh, issue alone. We have to band together with our allies and partners, and we've got to work in, in, in countries throughout the world, and that's what we've been doing. And we started out with, uh, we have 23 projects in the pipeline, uh, and I think we will continue to get projects, and we will, uh, if there are projects in Alaska, we will help find investors, we will help, help find uh, financing. Just a couple of more points. Uh, first of all, there I say again, 49 out of the 50 rare earth minerals are located in Alaska. And that's not counting the lower 48. That is that that is that includes far more. Mm -hmm. uh, lastly, we always hear about how we are going to destroy Anwar with the uh, the drilling. I'll make the point that everyone always makes the drilling area in Anwar is analogous to a postage stamp on a football field. Let me say that again, a postage stamp on a football field. Madam Chair, I, uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Earlier this year, uh, this, this committee passed my bill, the No Technology for Terror Act, to codify and expand the foreign direct product rule on tech and other know-how to Iran. I hope this bill will soon be considered on the House floor because I think full and re robust enforcement of the FDPR on Iran is critical to ensure Iran cannot continue to use U.S. origin goods and technology to make its lethal missiles and drones, the same missiles and drones being used to attack our forces and our allies currently. Uh, because this undermines the international shipping uh, in the Red Sea and, and Gulf of Aden as well. Uh, given the ongoing prolifer proliferation in Iranian missiles and drones, often made with U.S. origin components from China, can either of you please explain how this administration is using the foreign direct product rule to restrict Iran's access to U.S. origin technology? Sure. Uh, let me take that, and thank you for the question, Congressman. And I just received your letter uh, about that, sort of studying for this hearing, but we'll get, get your response as soon as I can. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, you know, we invoke foreign direct product rule uh, to a number of Iranian entities, about 20 Iranian entities, uh, starting at the beginning of last year, and then a number that are involved in the building of the Soviet, uh, Soviet Russian uh, drone factories with Iranian technology. And we invoked foreign direct product rule on a number of EAR-99 products that, again, we're saying American origin, they're not really U.S. origin, they're U.S. company branded that are produced elsewhere in the globe so that invoking foreign direct product rule ensures that they are under that and those companies understand that uh, they are liable for controlling their supply chains. And my enforcement folks, both through the, the strike force that they're doing with justice and on their own, are tracking what is flowing and we're pulling stuff off the Iranian battlefield. And Under Secretary Fernandez and I are directly engaging companies whose products we are seeing either 
flowing into Russian military equipment or Iranian military equipment. And, and you mentioned enforcement. So what are some of the barriers to enforcement right now of the foreign direct product rule? And what do we need to do to, to give you better tools to enforce that rule? First of all, the foreign direct product rule is actually very complicated and we've been invoking it a lot lately, uh, both within China and now Russia and Iran. Uh, it is a great tool. Uh, it is best done in consultation with allies. Uh, for non-allied partners, we'll, you know, we'll go after them and we'll enforce either administratively or criminally as we, we assess violations. The best thing I can get for help, frankly, is funding for my enforcement team. Are, are allies cooperating with the enforcement measures that we're trying to undertake, or are we getting pushback? Uh, are, for, for allies with foreign direct product, normally we let them know we were going to do it and why we're doing it, and we're getting uh, very good cooperation from our allies. Good. Uh, have you guys given consideration to expanding the foreign direct product rule to ensure that it covers all nine categories on the uh, commerce control list to potentially close all those gaps? Again, uh, foreign direct product rule started off really as a break glass used in extension emergencies. The threats in the world have caused those extension emergencies. Uh, but we still try to use it cautiously and, again, in consultation generally with our allies, sometimes who, frankly, ask us to use it so they don't have to use their own authorities to do it. Uh, I'd have to go back and look. I, I'm always wary of over-broadening it because if, I think if we overuse it, you lose it. Uh, no, and I agree with you on that. But, I mean, as you guys have implemented this and tried to enforce it, Internally, have you said, hey, we really need to expand it in this area or that area? Are there areas you've identified that you really need some expansion in this in this arena? I, I, I don't that I, I see, and I'd certainly have the authorities. I don't need anything from Congress in that respect from an authority standpoint related to FDPR. Uh, but we're certainly happy to work with you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, real briefly, in February, the administration imposed sanctions on four companies providing materials and technology to Iran's missile and drone programs. How extensive uh, can you guys talk about is the China is China's support for Iran's weapons programs? Yeah, I, again, you know, we see, first of all, a lot of those parts are actually produced in China. <laughs> and then flow out, which is why we invoke foreign direct product, regardless of whether it's a U.S. or not. I have 121 Chinese companies on the entity list related to either direct backfill to Russia or through Iran to Russia. Thank you, gentlemen. My time has expired. I want to thank the undersecretaries for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the committee may have some additional questions, and we will ask you to respond to these in writing. Pursuant to committee rules, all members may have five days to submit statements, questions, and extraneous materials for the record, subject to the length limitations. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you, gentlemen.